Well, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Welcome on into the Dragon's Den. Good morning. Glad to have everybody here. And yes, there you go, Mr. Wizix. And to answer your question, webs and flows, um, got your coffee ready? I sure do. Well, um, yes. Yes, I do. In fact, let's, uh, let's come and take a look at this one. So this is my Black Rifle Coffee Company cup with their uh, coffee or die symbol, logo. Um, and I will tell you that this cup right here holds the same amount of coffee as this mug. <laughs> so this is, this is twice as big as the coffee cup that I normally have on the desk. Definitely a full fister. And yes, coffee or die, yep. Um, yes, it is a drinking size mug. This is actually the Keurig. Um, two two uh, pods in the Keurig on the uh, medium setting. Medium size setting, so it's about 20 ounces right it's a big mug. If you guys are familiar with the, like the, you used to be able to get like Campbell's mugs um, that you could make soup in, like a can of Campbell's soup in it. Yeah, that's, that's about the same size here. Hey, Aaron, how's it going? Welcome on in. Welcome on in. Yeah, exactly. You can still find them occasionally. Uh, but yeah, welcome on in, everybody. Um, so, yeah, it's been a fun couple of days here in the Dragon's Den. The Trident is, of course, moved off the bench and is down on the floor. And yeah, I did a video showing how well it was printing doing the face plates for the drawers that I have in the desk or under the uh, workbench. And then you'll notice we had an issue. Houston, we have an issue, right? Well, I didn't catch it and I started it over and I didn't really catch why. And then I realized why. Um, so I'm pulling off of a three kilogram spool of black ABS. And apparently there was enough tension there that it pulled the ETFE tube out of the back of the printer some slightly. So when it went to the front move, the PTFE tube literally came out of the top and did an almost immediate 90 and straight to the back. And so, one, I'm going to be replacing some PTFE tube. And then, two, I'm going to have to try and figure out why, on a three kilogram spool, it was pulling the PTFE tube back out of the printer to begin with. Um, it makes no sense. I've never had that happen to where it's literally pulled a PTFE tube away from the printer. So I'll be replacing that PTFE tube, and I may take the back plate out and do a, uh, a straight out pass through. So there's, there's some things I need to do on the, uh, on the tool head there uh, before we get it printing again. But yeah, that was kind of depressing. But as it stands right now, I've got eight of my filament drawers down here. And the plan will be to add another piece of board across the top and some sides and basically make it so I can put a drawer right down here at the bottom or at least have an open space where I can take things like the Epics, pliers, where I can take things that I'm using a lot, like the Nipix pliers, and just have them sitting right underneath the desk here. Um, 
So they're easy to get to, but they're not on the surface all the time. Or I have to keep reaching around to grab things. So, and yes, it was a layer shift, but it was a layer shift because the PTFE tube had gotten pulled out and then it was stretched tight. And it, it prevented extruder from going all the way forward. So it skipped steps. Quite interesting. Um, but yeah. So today is black box day, so we are going to get going on black box. Yes, it was a very unusual problem, and like I said, I've never seen that. And the PTFE tube that I'm using there is three millimeter inside diameter, four millimeter outside. So why, how it even had enough friction to start pulling the PTFE tube out as it was tightening the spool? I, I don't know. It's a completely new problem for me. Um, oh no, no, no. The, the, the tube stayed in the, um, the hot end, but at the back panel, I'm, I'm running a back panel that allows for an angled exit. So there is no connector. It's a friction fit through the back panel piece. And that's where I'm saying I'm going to go and switch to the standard back panel with a straight connector out the back. So it's actually PTFE into a PTFE connector, um, which should solve that problem. Um, yeah, I just need to print a new back panel, and, which I've been needing to finish that piece. So, as mentioned, today is black box, and we're going to start building some tool heads. And speaking of tool heads, just to make sure that I had everything, you know, that I understood the process to try and streamline it as much as possible, I built the thing last night. So, this is ultimately what a Revo style tool head will look like. This piece um, is the mating piece that will get picked up by the X carriage. So it'll be metal to metal. That will allow for the conductive cooling through the, the water block. And then your, your cool zone here. Um, it actually attaches at the backside to the, that, uh, aluminum strip with the water block that we added on the last stream. So that's going to connect at the back and then at the front it it slides up and rides up against the X carriage plate itself. That's how it keeps your cool zone cool. So this is what we're going to be building today. Um, so I, I will say that I'm going to have to build a couple of parts because I did mess one part up putting in some heat sets and I may have broken a part, but that was on the FTM tool mount. So I got to fix, you know, print out a couple of things to fix them. Then I was talking with KB3D Chris last night and said, hey, Chris, um, there's some parts missed. And Chris goes, well, no, there's no parts that are missed. You just didn't order one of the packages. Oh, okay. So that's on order. We're we're getting that solved. Um, that that was just a blunder on my on my part, but uh, we'll we'll get that solved, and we will keep going with no problem. I've got enough hardware here right now that I can work around it. Tell the the order I placed last night will come. But the plan is we're going to build another FDM tool. We're going to build one. Um, and then we'll go on to the electronics. There is a part or a guide for 07B, which is, uh, what is the name? It's like tool head. Um, Uh, 
Oh, yeah. I, I know I've got it. I've got it. So find it quickly. But it's basically. Um, give me one second. Words are escaping me. Let me get the actual. There we go. FDM tool adjustment. And what that's going to entail is adding the umbilical, the PTFE tube and stuff like that, but also checking and making the necessary adjustments so that the tool head docks easily. And when it's picked up, that every that we actually have the physical connection between the the needed parts to allow for proper cooling. So in other words, um, we'll have our our X gantry plate, and then we've got our tool head block. It's supposed to come over, pick up the tool, and everything's going to stay touching. If there's a gap or it's at an angle or anything like that, you're not gonna have proper um, uh, thermal transfer to allow that, that hot side of your tool head to stay cool, and you'll get clogs, jams, and all kinds of things. So it's gonna be need to be adjusted, and what I wanna do is I've built one tool, we're gonna build one tool on stream, I'll get my other tools built off stream, and then next week, what we'll do is we'll work on the adjustment process and actually do the tweaking to make sure that the tool can be, is properly aligned and is touching both parts that will provide the water cooling to those hot end components. And we'll make any adjustments that we need to there. Um, so there are a couple of specialty tools that we will be needing. Um, for this part of the build process. So that's why you'll see that I've got a lot of different tools here because I found out last night we're going to need a lot of different tools. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so there's several things that we're going to need. So heat, heat sinking paste. I'll put a caveat on that. If you're building a Revo, you don't need it. If you're building a standard V6 heat break, or uh, we'll say like the Krakens, or I'll say similar to the, the um, um, reality, where you've got a smooth sideboard uh, heat break versus the threaded M6, uh, then you're gonna need to use heat paste on those. Um, to allow for better thermal transfer. I I believe, Chris, tell me if I'm wrong, I, I don't believe we need to add the thermal compound to the uh, Revo just simply because it, it'll basically get everywhere and try to screw it in. Um, but we will need our hand tap. We will need um, hex wrenches. That's to tighten your nozzle and everything in place. Um, Open end wrench if needed for your V6 style. Uh, some lightweight oil for the gear train. Uh, if you notice, we haven't been using lightweight oil. Uh, we're we're going to continue to use our uh, Mobile Lux for the gears, and these are the needle gears and the Vontech uh, gear drives. Reamers, thread locker, standard stuff that we've been using the whole long. Uh, we've got the parts that we'll need. Once again, this is where I realized I ordered the FDM toolkit, but there is an FDM fastener kit that you also have to get for each tool head. And that's where I didn't get some things. So I'm having to substitute in some screw sizes that are unique that are not in the base fastener kit. That's something to remember. And Chris, I'm not sure if you got my note last night on Discord, but the 
FDM fastener kit is listed under the black box configurator page, but I couldn't find it as a standalone item looking under the black box, just like hardware listing or full head listing. And it's not in the, I'll say the kit, you know, the, the different sub kit section. The only way I found it was to copy the, like the name from the configurator tool and search for it. So, yeah, that, that, that'll be something that needs to be fixed or, or a page added or something. Um, as well as, you know, if you're, if you're buying this, try and get it added as a, you know, you may also need or want this down at the bottom of that page, because that'll help. Good morning, Pez Liz. How are you? Baker My Nexus, greetings, and thank you, my friend, for getting that, uh, that other thing taken care of for me yesterday. Lucas Player, welcome in. Shaudel, uh, we're drinking uh, Black Rifle coffee today. This is my uh, Black Rifle mug. So, new mug on the channel. I've had it for a while. I just, uh, I normally don't have this one up here because this is like, 20 or so ounces of coffee, so it's a little bit bigger and heavier. Um, some printed jigs. So here's the other issue that I found, uh, Chris. This print jig 51 gear setter, don't know where it's at. It is not on the GitHub and it's not in any of the zip files. So this jig, and I'll show you all when we get there, does not exist, and I will show you how I got around the problem. The jig for the wire spring is there. We won't use that until we go into the 07B tool head adjustment section next week. So, some preparation stuff. Assembling your FDM tools with precision and care will lead to re long-term reliable tool changes in operation. When compared to the rest of the machine, inaccuracies in either geometry or assembly can result in significant effects to printed part quality and extrusion consistency. That's critical. Be sure to print and pass the black box readiness test print if you haven't already before printing these parts specifically, okay? Um, this is the, the critical piece because um, you'll see later on the quality of these parts will impact your actual tool pickup and docking procedures because of the ability to get onto the docking pins and for everything to line up properly. So that's something to be careful of. So we're going to locate part three, and we've got our list of FDM parts. Um, and you'll see I I put a uh, a paper towel down here just to make things a little bit easier to see as we go through today's build part. Um. And you may also notice that it's going to tell us to do a couple of things. And the first thing it's going to tell us to do is take a two millimeter reamer. Reamer. And you want to go through your filament pass. So look for this piece up here at the top. This is your filament inlet. And you want to take a two millimeter reamer completely through this part. If you can't get completely through, at least go through the first section and then go through the other section. This is pretty standard. You get the same suggestion on like a CW2 and the other tool head parts on a boron or just about any extruder mechanism. Take a two inch reamer and make sure that you have a clear filament path through and through your part. Get it to line up there. 
so that you make sure that you don't have any, any print issues in that filament patch. You want that as smooth as possible. Preferably using a two millimeter reamer, my reaming set starts off with a three millimeter. And the reaming set that I purchased from KB3D, I'm pretty sure I got the reaming set, hasn't, hasn't shipped yet because there's some things that are on back order in that order. So I'm not sure if it has the two millimeter or not. If you have a two millimeter reamer, use the reamer. It's going to give you a, a more concentrical, better hole. It does good. Okay, Pez, you're poking in and out. Farmer, former Prime Minister Mulroney's state funeral. Uh, okay, gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. And then the next thing up, we're going to put in some heat sets. Now, I will tell you this. I, I did all the holes on all four of my tool head printed parts. And I did the heat sets for the one I built last night. And this set um, I did last night just to make it easier so I didn't have to keep getting that piece out. But there's eight total heat sets. Three on this face. And let me see if I can get this oriented. So you got these three. This one. This one. This one. And then we're going to take the part and flip it over. And there's one on the back. One on this side. Um, now, all of these are flushed except for this one. You've got to be careful. This one's going in on a sloped surface. So you need to make sure that it is down as far as the lowest sloped edges and that it's in there. And then what you'll probably need to do is come in with a hobby knife. So all the other ones are on flat surfaces. I get it really close. And then I'll go up against the side of my bench and I'll, and I'll kind of rotate it around on the bench there. And what that'll do is break off any filament that got pushed out of the hole and would sit proud. Here you can't do that because there's, there's no single flat surface. So you get that pushed in there, take your hobby knife going away from you and just make sure you clean up any of that plastic burr that pops up and don't do what I just did and try and stab yourself. We stab polymaker bags and open filament that way. Don't stab yourself. Okay. So we get all the heat sets set in here. Welcome on in, Hybrid Robotics. Good morning. Oh, you have a blizzard? I'm sorry, Pez. It was actually raining a lot last night. I, I fell asleep to the rain last night. And it's going to be like low, well, it's 58 right now, but we're going to stay in like the low 60s and have some rain throughout the day. So it's going to be another one of those eh, days. And all I really need to do after this is go shopping. So now we need to install the embedded Bowden coupling. So this is an E3D part. Um, it says the bottom or inward facing portion of the insert has a chamfered feature. Reaming the bore in which it sits will aid in easy installation. If seating is difficult with the tools at your disposal, it can also be treated as a standard heat set insert and installed that way. When fully seated, the insert will be flush with the printed part. So we're gonna go ahead and open up our FDM toolkit. And we're gonna take our spring steel wire. We're just gonna set that aside. We're not gonna use that today. That'll be um, next week's stream when we get into the tool adjustment. Um, we're going to have several things in here. We'll have our Bontech drive gears, the Bontech um, screw tensioning mechanism, Bontech gear, 
We're going to have the, um, this is like the tool lock piece. I can't remember. We'll, we'll get the right name of it when we get there. A SLS printed gear. And then our little test tube of all kinds of goodies. If you remember, we got into the test tube for the uh, bearing, the big bearings, the G, was it GT10 bearings, or, um, when we were doing the tool head plate. So, one, be careful opening that up so it doesn't send everything flying. And then we're going to take just a couple of things out of here. Um, we need the that fitting, the uh, button coupling, a little black piece that will pop in the button coupling, and your little blue locking. And I think, Chris, that I may have put the Bowden coupling in upside down yesterday. So help me out here, just to be on the safe side so I know whether I did it right or not. So this Bowden coupling, you've got focus. Please focus. Yes. So looking at it through from this side, we've got a chamfered inlet. Okay, and it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at the ring, um, there's kind of a a lower lip, kind of like a heat set insert, where the bottom piece is a is a smaller diameter, and that's the side that I put in first. So when you're looking from top down. You're looking through that chamfered piece. So that's how I installed this yesterday because it's how I kind of understand it is, um, but it says the bottom or inward facing portion of the insert has a chamfered feature. So I mean, the parts machine, so there is a chamfer, technically, sides. Um, but it looks like, okay, there you go. So the large chamfer portion, when you look at this, say the large chamfered bore portion needs to face inward. So it needs to be facing downward. So it needs to basically open up as you go down. And what you're seeing right here is that little lip or ring around the top, which is that little step down right there at the top. So it would focus. So I did install the first one upside down, which sucks, but that's life I will figure that out I figured it out faster and you can touch yeah so last night I did um I guess I did install the one last night backwards but they melt back out easily good that's good we'll have to work on that so I will tell you you're going to see me use the nipix a lot you can Basically melt these in just like a heat set insert or you can press fit them. Um, just be careful either way you do it. Like I'll sit here and try and go like that and I can't even get it started because of the, the way these print, because they print flat, you will get at the very top more of, an, of a straight edge overhang. So you might have to use a reamer on this hole just a little bit to open it up. Um, probably looks like an eight millimeter.
So we're in that hole just to get some of that excess uh, material out of the way. Make sure that we have it oriented right. Line it up with a hole and get it started. And then there's two things that you can do. You can put it on a hard surface and push it in. And if that doesn't work, or you don't think it has worked all the way, which does actually look like it worked all the way. Maybe not. Um, then you grab your Nipix. Um, I would say you could use a vise, but if you're going to use a vise, make sure it doesn't have a serrated jaw. Make sure you have a soft jaw in your vise. Um, oh, hey, Chris, thanks for gifting Poity a gift sub. Welcome on in, Poity. Whoops. I know from doing this last night that it's pretty much the full jaw length here. Actually, that side, I can't do the full jaw length. This was where I used one of the smaller ones and carefully there's a couple of, of Bridges that you could use, but you have to be very careful in how you do this so you don't change the geometry of the part. And we're just making sure that this is fully seated, which I think it is. Just wanting to verify. It went down just a tiny bit. That's and that's good there. Um, once again, we're making sure that our parts are fully seated so we don't have any issues. Now, once we have that done, we'll put in our little black piece and then the blue clip. And I say that as if I haven't knocked them away and made them disappear. Black piece and the blue clip. So your black piece um, just has a couple of spots in it. And there's these little metal bearings on the inside. That's what helps everything feed in right. You're just going to pop that down in there. And that'll give you your little compression fitting that we're used to seeing. You'll take your blue, your blue clip and just feed it on there. Like that. Uh-oh, now we're doing raffles. Thanks for uh, being such a good mod, uh, KB3D Chris. Mr. Wizix, hello. I see somebody new sneak in. Well, uh, Wick Allen, uh, congratulations on being gifted a sub. Hey, Poity. Welcome in. Glad you're here. So now we're going to locate and install our MRZ88 bearings. Those are once again in our tube. So we're going to, and they're down at the bottom of our tube beneath the magnet so everything in here is now stuck together so we're going to try and dump all that out get our bearings pulled apart and then what i'm going to try and do is take the magnets and just put the magnets back in there so they stop attracting everything And we're going to take one of our bearings and it's going to go all the way down in the bottom of this channel. Okay, it's kind of hard to see, but it's going to go all the way down in the bottom of this channel. 
So what I'm going to do is I do see a little shave of, of filament. But once again, I'm going to use my 8 millimeter uh, reamer. And the nice thing is this has a chamfered edge, so I'm not going to get all the way down to the bottom of this, but I will be able to get the top portion reamed out just a tad bit. And that will allow me to get my bearing started down in there. And my same eight millimeter reamer, turn it around to the smooth side that would go in your chuck. We're gonna use that to initially start to press our bearing down in there. Now you see it's well proud. It's not down in there all the way. I've just got it started seating. Now, the, the easiest thing I found last night is grab your Nipix. And very gently, you want to go across the entire face of the bearing and be very gentle. So smooth jaw, go completely across the face of the bearing. I actually need to get the smaller one. Is this one the uh, jaw face too wide? Yeah, it is a good habit to always have your bearings. I've lost a set of bearings. I still haven't been able to find them. I had ordered a set of these MRZ 885s. Have no idea. They're somewhere in this room. Completely have no idea where they're at. And I had to order more from KB3D, and they're sitting right here in my little part. But smooth jaw pliers, completely over the top of the bearing, right? Completely over the top of the bearing so that we're getting on both external faces of the bearing. And then you will gently squeeze. Figure out that you that you're one jaw too many. So adjust that again. And then very gentle squeeze. And if you have to keep adjusting this, that's fine. You don't want it. Uh, the biggest thing here is just making sure that you're nice and even and square. And then very gently apply gentle pressure and it will sink that down in the part. And you may have to make a couple of adjustments. That's perfectly fine. Take your time. You don't want to split the part. And if you just go real fast, you're probably going to split the part. If you go nice and slow, one, you don't deform the bearing races. And two, um, You'll get it fully seated down in the part, which is what we need. And you'll see now if we look at it straight on, that bearing is fully seated down in there. Take your time when you're press fitting your bearings. You don't want to mess those up. Um, now this is the this is the fun part. So this step requires mechanically removing and replacing the standard 51 tooth bearing. So oh, bearing 51 tooth gear off of the Bontech shaft. So you're going to open up your shaft and pull out the shaft piece. Be careful because I don't know why they always provide a set screw in there. I don't know if it's just a spare for the drive gear, but I don't know why they always put a set screw in there. Um, but here's where it gets fun. Preferably, you have a gear puller. Okay? Um... Your main Nipix in your work bag are nearly are nearly smooth jaw after 20 plus years of service. There you go. Yeah, 
this set of Nipix smooth jaw pliers um, was a surprise Christmas gift from my channel sponsor, KB3D Chris. So, yeah. And I think he got these for me knowing I was going to be doing the black box build, but I have used it on every build since then. And I, I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I ever lived without them. Hey, hybrid, just check that you don't have them like sitting on your head already. Don't ask me why, but I've done that several times. Right? Yeah. Um, so several things that you can do here. We need to pull this gear off, but we need to be careful in doing it. If you have a press, you can press this shaft out of the out of the gear. If you don't, okay, you can you can have it in a press. You can put it in a vise um, and then push out this. But you want to be careful that you're not hammering this in. That is a last resort because you can peen over this end. And if Shenanigans is on here, I'd say ask Shenanigans how easy it is to get uh, bearings and things off of an end of hardened steel shaft that you've peened over. Um, or you can cut a slit. Just be careful that you don't go all the way to your, your gear. Cut a slit with a uh, Dremel tool. And I will show you what I did. So I had purchased a gear puller from Amazon. I want to say this is a Great Plains gear puller. You use it for like propellers, mounting propellers and taking propellers off of the front motor gears. And you'll see that it's got screws and bolts that go through the top plate and there's a bottom plate. There's two of these bottom plates and you've got two different sets of plungers that are changeable with a set screw, right? So I swapped this out for the larger slotted plate and what you'll do is you'll move this out. Now your gear is not gonna go straight in there, it won't fit. So you do the next thing, you kind of angle it in and you get your gear to pop down in there. Now the nice thing is that leaves your gear fully supported and you can use the plunger to press out the gear. So just wind this down, you'll get it on top and then you're just going to slowly press out your gear. Yes, this is a very good tool and it comes in handy. So we're just pressing out the shaft out of the gear. And it'll drop out eventually. Just like that. Now. Rotate this up so you can get your gear back out. Don't throw that away, you're going to need it. Put this back away so that it stays nice and protected. So the next thing we need to do is start the engagement of our new gear on the shaft. Now, interesting thing, these are provided in the FDM toolkits, okay? These SLS printed gears. If you print all of the parts, you will also print a gear. Use this one because it's made out of uh, IGUS iGlide material, and this will work better than the one that you print. Also, the one that you print is fully flat on one edge, and it'll be hard to tell here, but these teeth actually come up and round over onto the top of the gear. And this image that we see here, you can see kind of where the line is there would be where the flat spot is. So it does round up and over. That is critical. Do not 
set this down on a surface and try and press this bearing in. You will damage those front teeth or those top parts of the teeth and you will have engagement issues. Okay? Yep. Um, I want to say this, this gear puller is from Great Plains. I will look it up and I'll have to look it up in my Amazon history and I can send it to you. Yeah, so I'll show you how we're going to how we're going to push that um that new gear on. Right? So once again, begin by starting the engagement of the driven gear on the shaft. Um, note that the crown of the driven gear has teeth that protrude past the surface. Don't put it down on a work surface and press down on it. Okay? Yeah, Great Plains Gear Puller finds it in Amazon. Um, used them for my uh, model airplane stuff back in the day. Now, one thing that you can do, and there's a note in here as well. Um, now we'll be installing the new SLS printed 51 tooth gear. Note that the SLS printed parts have a larger demand tolerance allowance than the FDM printed part. So if you did FDM print the gear, hold this as a stop gap um, if, if you break something, right? Otherwise, throw that away. Um, for this reason, some gears may require reaming where others may not. My suggestion, don't ream it. Try and fit it first and use a, um, a deburn tool or a countersink tool. They're pretty much the same thing. And the part of the shaft that protrudes out, just take not, don't press into it, just very, very light pressure. All you want is a very slight chamfer just to enable you to get the shaft started on there. And once again, we're going to start pushing it on where the little teeth are in the shaft. That's the end we're going to go in. So you just want to get it started like that. That little chamfer helps get rid of any burr at the edge. So it pops on there real easy. But as soon as it hits these teeth, these teeth are a little bit larger in diameter than the rest of the shaft. So that's where we're going to be press fitting on. Now, your puller pulls gear. We're not going to be able to press this new gear on because the shaft of the puller is too, too long or the shaft for the uh, gear is too long. So, we go back to our trusty Nipix. Hey, shenanigans, how's it going? I was using your name earlier and the fact that, that we said, do not try and hammer these on because you'll peen over the end. And then you'll have some issues and you'll have to sand it or turn it down. Um, but here's the thing. You take your Nipix, which is a long, smooth jaw, and you go like this and start to press this on. Well, you might as well flip this over and jam it on the table because you're going to bust these gears up. This is why when you go to press things together, if you're using a vise or whatever, there is a printed tool. Locate the printed gear pressing tool and note the orientation. Chris, big note here. This tool is not in the downloadable files. This tool is not in the GitHub. Okay. So. What are we going to do? 
Remember I said don't get rid of this gear, you're going to need it? So this gear, once again, has an offset center on one side. So if I take this gear, put it on top of this gear, I'm going to be centered on the shaft, and I'm not going to impact any of the teeth on that SLS gear. All I need to do is get my nipix adjusted correctly to account for that full length like so, and once again, don't play Barbarian like Chris, and just slowly, gently, squeeze your Nipix, and press that new gear down on the tooth shaft. Once again, if you do it real fast, you could crack your gear. Now, that's fully down, and I still have a lot of those exposed teeth on the jaw there, which I can tell is not far enough, right? We're going to move our Nipix up another tooth or so. And you'll notice we're just now pressed to the, the edge of the printed part there. So, get lined up again. Gently. And what we're doing is we're going to be pressing this shaft back into the original gear as well. But that's fine. That keeps alignment and makes sure that we're putting pressure straight up and down on the shaft. Go slow so you don't push it on there too far. And I will tell you when I did this last night, so the old plastic gear is on there just a little bit. Um, and I'm going to have to go a little bit further. Last night, what I did was I took the other bearing, just sat it next to it and said, how far do I need to press this in before the bearing would just be flush with the top of this edge? Go a tad bit more. If not, the backside of this will, will uh... so eventually you're gonna have the other bearing in here and this is gonna fit right in there. So if you're not in there far enough, you will drag these raised teeth on the back side of this part and you'll get binding. And then you'll have to take some things apart to squeeze this down on there a little. So we'll work and, and make this a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll squeeze this on there just a little bit more. What you're going to be looking for is for the shaft to be just slightly, it's going to be hard to get this to be in focus, to be just slightly higher than the bearing itself. Not a much, maybe a millimeter, okay? And now you've got that, that or the uh, gear pressed onto the bearing almost all the way down through the teeth, like the old one was. And that's gonna be a correct fit. Oh yes, Cookie Monster, definitely. Well, but see, that Timor, what you do there is you just go and borrow it back from them and then you never return. Back in the day, we used to engrave all our tools in the military, so I started engraving my tools so I could easily go back and get it from my, from my friends. And when they say, no, dude, that's mine, I'd say, really, why is it engraved with my initials or my, you know, whatever. So once again, press, squeeze. We kind of did a press, squeeze, 
with the way we did that, right? Very safe. And the last option is hammer time. Use a dead blow or a brass hammer. No three pound sledges or anything else. You gotta be careful or you'll, you could split and break this part. Like I said, go really slow when you're pressing it so you don't bust that part. If you go too fast, you could crack and bust that. Option three was built, for, it was written for build over bot, yeah. And here's a view of what it would look like. And if you had that 3D printed tool, it would give you the correct height. You just squeeze until you couldn't squeeze anymore and you'd be at the correct depth. You have an option for uncoordinated people. You're a mechanic, you can only touch my tools if I can touch your wife. Oh. There you go, Hydro Robotic. Ship it to Luke with a $5 bill. Oh, that's awesome. So now it's going to be standard Bond Techie stuff. Um, we need our gears. So we'll pull our gears out. Um, So the nice thing is when Bontec does theirs, the gear with the shaft and the needle bearings are already in it. So you know which one to grab and which one not to grab when you're installing the part with the set screw, right? Uh, that set screw is a 1.5 uh, driver. So we're gonna go ahead and pull that set screw out. No need to completely undo it at this point because we're not going to be putting um, Loctite on it just yet, okay? And it goes in, I say that, now there we go. So it's going to go in in this orientation as noted in our drawing diagram. Right? So the filament path goes up against the gear. And all we're doing right now is we're going to tighten it up just enough so it stays in that flat grooved area, right? So you'll start tightening it back up and wiggle your, your ear back and forth and that'll help align it and make sure it's in that spot. Very tight or very loose. We're just getting it held on this shaft until we can start putting things together. And speaking of which, the next thing we're going to do is put our shaft with that gear on that bearing in there. We're going to line that up. It'll slide right down. And once again, line it up, push on the shaft down into the bearing. Just like that. Don't push on the gear push on the shaft. You want to make sure you're going straight. If you're going in at an angle on the bearing, you can damage things, right? So we're on that shaft and you can tell whether you've got fairly good alignment with the filament path just by looking, right? But then also the next step is going to tell us to grab a little bit of filament put in there to make sure we're fully lined up. Right, so we're going to put in some filament. So just grab a piece of filament. I like it says preferably, you know, a flat piece. If you want a flat piece of filament, you're probably opening up a brand new spool and you're going to be working it flat. But if you're like me and you've got some filament that's been out for a little while, it's not going to stay too flat, straight. Do your best. You just have to be careful and work it without breaking it. You can get it somewhat straight. You're going to run it through that filament path. And there we go. So we've got it through our filament path. It's been lined up pretty good. What you can do is 
loosen your grub screw. Don't take it all the way out, just loosen it. And you can rock this back and forth till you get the perfect alignment that you like. And then we would tighten this down. Now, we do need to pop this out and put a little bit of Loctite on it. So be careful that you don't rotate that gear off of the flat or lose your set screw like I just did. Curious. There we go. Found it. We put a little bit of Loctite on there. Oh yeah, used tools are great, and especially if they they came down through family. Seriously. working this in make sure you're in the, the flat portion make sure you're lined up tighten that down okay and don't worry you'll have access to this if you need to come in here and, and readjust you'll you'll have you'll have the ability to get to black box does not come with a chamber heater by default can you add one yes you can Timor um so now uh i wind up normally just leaving this filament in there most of the time while i build them but i am going to take it out for now i'm going to set that down and we're going to find this piece and we're going to need to put a couple of heat set inserts in so i've already got them be careful on heat sets like this they are real close to the edge of the part you need to go slow and make sure you're centered. When you push that down, if you're off a little bit, you'll blow out the side of that part, which will lead to some issue. Now, the next thing that we're gonna need to do is insert a two millimeter by six millimeter length of dowel pin. And that's going to go in this part right up in that hole right above the heat set now what i did last night to make it easier is i'm going to take my two millimeter drill bit or preferably a two millimeter reamer which i don't have um Be more, I have finished it. It is functional. It is working. I have not installed it in the printer that I was planning on installing it in just yet. I'm still debating because it's tw 12 volt. I would have to either do a buck converter or run a separate supply for it. Um, and I'm debating whether or not I want to try and switch it up to a 24 volt. So I'm going to take my two millimeter drill bit by hand and just make sure that the very beginning of this hole is open just a little bit. Okay, I'm not trying to, to get down in there. I'm just trying to open that hole up a little bit so that I can get this fiddly little two millimeter by six started. And you'll see what I mean by fiddly here in a second. So that's in the shafts. 
box in our black box motion kit is where we've got our tiny, tiny three by three magnet. Um, Oh, there we go. Our little two millimeter by six millimeter. I couldn't get this darn lid off last night, but got the three holes in it. If you kind of shake it enough, one will probably line up and pop out for you. Make sure you close that back up before you put it in there. So these are fiddly and they are tiny. So that's why I say try and open up at least the very beginning of the hole sum to correct size so that you can get this pin started. And then once you get it started, you can come back in with your Nipix pliers. I have to use. Once again, small pen in a very small hole, and it's not going to go in all the way. This is an alignment pen. So take your time. It's, it's still going to be proud of the part. We're not trying to do a flush fit on this. So get it lined up, and then just gently push it in. Make sure it's fully seated down. Okay. And that's all we're looking for. You got to remember, you got to be gentle when you're press fitting these parts. You want them to be tight. If they're not, then you're breaking out the epoxy. So. Oh, geez. Well, I've got a... An obs I've got another one of my obsidian nozzles that clogged and it's to the point where I've like my no my nozzle reamers I bent two of them so I'm just going to put it in a jar of acetone and and dissolve because it was ABS the so next up we're going to take this little part that we have and we're going to secure it with an M3 by 16 socket head screw. Okay. And once again, on, on one face, you'll see there's the M3 screw hole with the M2 alignment head. So, of course, that's going to align with our part here. So, line up your peg. And I'm just going to work it on with a little rocking motion and get it close. And then we're going to need our M3 by 16 socket head cap screw. And Now, please note, I am grabbing the M3 socket head cap screw out of the main kit. You should have ordered a separate FDM tool head fastener kit. And I will replace these once I get the ones that I just ordered from Chris. Um, because if you, if you don't, you're going to run out of fasteners in your main kit before you get your printer built. So. Case in point. So we got this piece on there. This is going to go right in on this end. 
and we'll need our two and a half millimeter driver and we're going to bring this in and you'll see that we'll close our gap on both sides and bring that flush and tight with the other part. Don't ugga dugga too much. You just want to make sure that your parts are fully seated against each other and are now one. Okay. Hey, customers first. What? Oh, with a metallic chrome filament. Yeah. I had um, Polymaker Silk Chrome. Love the look. It prints beautifully. And I had it clogged three times on me printing a helmet. And it just, it was frustrating. Okay, so here it says to install the needle bearings into the Bontech gear and then place the idler gear in the printed hinge. Noting the orientation, capture the coupler. Um, and it says to do a light oiling. Well, we're going to do a light greasing. So be careful. Your Bontech gears will come in some foam and your shaft will already be in there with your needle bearings. Pull your shaft out. Make sure you don't drop your needle bearings. Hey, Mayhem, welcome on in. We're going to pop out our Mobile Lux. Don't worry, uh, I've got three more tubes of these sitting over there. Stock up when I, when I order from KB3D. We're going to squirt a little bit of this down in there. And then, like standard, we're going to take our shaft. Push it down in the bearings. We're holding the opposite side with our finger. We're going to start pressing this down in there. You'll feel it start to pressure or build pressure. And as you push it down, you'll see that that top bearing will start to pop up. Probably, maybe. I just put my fingernail on there and continue to push that all the way through. And out the other side. And I normally I'll bring this flush and then wipe off that excess. If you get a little bit of grease on the side of the gear that the, you know the larger end that meshes, that's not a problem. You don't want any grease, oil, or anything else in your filament pad. Now this is the part where we're going to do some things a little bit different for us boron folks. Normally, we leave that shaft in there and we'll press fit that shaft and just clip it in. On the black box, these are fully sealed holes, so we're gonna have to push the bear or the push the shaft through the part with the uh, bearings already installed. So what we're gonna do is just real quickly. Clean up some little spots on our printed part there. Take a file and lightly clean off any uh, strays. Do the same thing on these mating surfaces. Um, very light. We're just trying to make sure that there's nothing in the way that's going to foul these parts as we press them together using these shafts. Now, on this part, we're going to be pressing a three millimeter shaft through this. And you can see there's not very much meat above that hole. If you press that shaft in without verifying that that hole's good, you will crack this part. 
Ask me how I know. That is one of the said parts that I will be reprinting. Um, luckily, I printed four sets of these because I knew I was going to build four tool heads. So I've got spares. So three millimeter reamer. Reamer. Um, so this is the thin side. This is the thicker side. My plan is to ream this hole fully to allow me to get the shaft in. Okay. Nice and reamed out there. Then I'm going to push through to that hole and I'm going to start to ream it. I'm not going to ream all the way through. In fact, I won't be able to ream further just because I can't get a grip on it. Good morning, Britt. How are you doing today, nerd? You're going to see me chuck this up in the drill. You're also going to see me put my hand around it so that I can keep it from going fully through the bore. Because once again, I don't want to go fully through that bore. I do want it to be a good press fit at the end so that there's no chance of this backing out down the road. We're going to do the same thing down on this pivot joint. All the way through. And then we'll say 50 to 60% through the the thicker side over here. That will ensure that I can get the shaft in without breaking the part, but also give me a good press fit at the end to keep the shaft from falling back out. So now we need to Just dressing the corners in these parts some. Uh, love the carbon fiber filament, but yeah, it does get some stringiness on the edges. You got to keep this stuff dry. Yeah, I. So we need to be cognizant of which way this gear goes in. So facing you, the thicker gear goes on this side. The filament side goes on the thinner edge over here. So pick up your, your bearing here, pull the shaft out. We're going to set this down in there. And we'll line up the hole in the shaft. Make sure you're going straight. Um, if you're at an angle, you're going to mess up your bearings. Right? And then once you get close, you should be able to push that and press it in all the way. It needs to be all the way flush. If you can catch it with your fingernail, it's not good enough. Grab your Nipix and help it the rest of the way. Gently help it the rest of the way. Just make sure to be cognizant of that lip there. Very gently. Press it in there, make sure you can't catch it with your finger and that it still spins. There you go. Now we're going to align this and we're going to do our next pin. So we're going to be going through this hole here. 
which is that hole right there. So we're going to line this up like so. And we're going to take a M3 by, I believe it's 22 shaft. And you'll have two of them that came in your kit. Actually, one's 22 and one's 20. So, Chris, here's the thing. You're providing a 22 and a 20 in the kit, but the 20 comes with the Bontech gear. So you kind of don't need it. Um, it's a little bit extra, so I, I've got a whole bag of them, though. And we're going to take this, and we're going to feed it through. Now, you'll notice, I reamed this piece out. I had not reamed this piece out. I might want to ream this piece out. Come from this side, you will miss the gear. If you're worried, you can pull your gear back out like so. So when you ream this part, there's no chance that you're going to hit that gear and damage it. And, you know, ABS, PLA, well, one, that you're not going to do these in PLA, but your ABS, ASA, may give a little bit more. Remember, this is polycarbonate CF that I used. Reaming is crucial. And especially on pivot joints. Right. If you're looking for a a press fit, um, then be careful with reaming. We found that out where we had reamed some parts, and then we wound up having to use some epoxy to hold them in because the uh, the tolerance is so good. Then when you ream it, because it's a precision sized hole and it's perfectly round, that your shafts can potentially go all the way through. And not hold if they're supposed to be held in place. So once again, just line this up, start pushing this through. It should go fairly easy now. If it starts to get hard to push in by hand, well, you've got your nipix. Or you should have your nipix. Make sure you're adjusted appropriately. Want to make sure that that's flush as well. So keep adjusting if you need to to make sure that it's flush on both sides. Because once again, this is a pivot joint. And if you've got anything out on one side or the other, it's not going to pivot well. It's going to catch on something. So nice good pivot joint. Our filament path is lining up. Go ahead and take our big gear and put it back in there and line it up with the bearing. And make sure that our filament paths are lining up, which they are, we're just eyeballing that. Now we're gonna locate our back piece here and we're gonna need to press fit in another bearing. That press fit comes in from this side. I am seeing some wispiness, so let me clean that up. I'm being very light here. I'm not trying to take material off. I'm trying to get rid of a little string here or there that was present. So we've got the part, we're gonna press fit our bearing right there. So once again, take our bearing, get it lined up, start getting it pushed in. It goes in at an angle, not good. We want it to be flat. So here's, here's what I found out. This is a recessed piece. There's no way of getting flat on here and being able to press this in. 
oh wait, we still have a piece of bearing. Take this, put it right on top, grab your Nipix, and we'll press it in that way. I bet, I bet Chris didn't realize that this, this took the place of that printed tool in many ways. So once again, we're on a flat surface, flat surface, slowly press, low even pressure. Make sure that that bearing is fully seated all the way around and it looks to be. So we're good. So once again, our, our previous gear came in handy. And a little bit of that excess printed material popped up that I want to clean off so it doesn't uh, affect the bearing. Let's press fit in there. Now we need to install some five by four millimeter magnets. And these are going to press down in here. They're, they're not going to be flush with the surface. They're going to be fuller or deeper in there. There's little, I'll say printed shelves. These go down into, okay? Your Magnets are in here. The orientation does not matter. You broke it, matter hackers. I'm pretty much broke at KB3D. Every time I talk to them, I spend more money. Um, so we're just going to take our bearing stack and we're going to check to see if our if we got a good press fit in the holes. That one we do. And this one we... Okay, so this one's a little tight. What I'm going to do is rather than reaming it, I'm just going to take my countersink slash chamfering tool and chamfer just the, t the top part. Once again, what you will find is this heat set, when you put it in, that's a very thin wall. It will melt the edge of that some and make this a little bit harder fit. So make sure that we're, we're in the same direction. And we'll start to get the other one press fit in there. Whoops. That's not going, so maybe we will have to ream this. Once again, I don't want to ream all the way down to that shelf because if you do, um, it may no longer be a press fit. I'm just going to ream the very front piece of it so that I can get it started. Okay. Press them down by in until they're flush. Take a driver or other non-metallic thing. Fully seat them. You will notice this is flush. This is fully seated down in there against the shelf. This is what you want. You don't want it flush. The reason being your uh, four millimeter rods, this is the part that's going to mount up against the tool dock and your four millimeter rods are going to go right in. So they're going to go in the holes and it's going to get attracted to the magnets from the inside. If these aren't pushed all the way down, you're not going to get that extra magnetic pull to hold it on uh, when the tool head starts to come. Or the uh, 
carriage starts to come back on. So, got those. They're both seated down in there. And really, Chris, order of operations, if you're still here, we probably should set these magnets before we do this part, just because we've touched this part, then we put that part down, then we grab this and we do magnets. And then the very next thing after we do magnets is go grab this part again, and we're gonna mount it with that new bearing that we just pressed on the end of that shaft. So line it up and set it right on the end of that shaft. Now, I can tell I'm fully on the end of that shaft now. And just reach in there and move that by hand. You cannot move that gear by hand now. Save yourself some time. Pull this out. Push it on just a tad bit more. Um, yeah, just save yourself a little bit of time. So that's on there. Now we're going to locate our CNC part. I've already taken this out of our packaging, but this is our black box plate. Um, you've got this really nice, shiny, smooth side. And then the other side where you can see the tooling marks still with the black box. You notice this part, you're going to face down. And you'll notice there are some little ridges and lips in there. What we're going to do is we're going to take our two ball bearings, drop them in those holes. You'll notice that those little lips will now hold those in there and drop out. Now, you're going to take this part, tip it up, and mate it over. If you do it any other way, your balls are going flying. So, protect your balls. Now, with this sandwich plate on there, we need four M3 by 16 flathead hex screws. I don't have those. Those are screws that will come in the um, I just brain fart. Those are screws that will come in the uh, FDM fastener kit, the FDM tool fastener. Kit. I don't have that yet. I we figured that out last night um, when I was telling Chris I had to scrounge for some missing bolts. And that's where we realized we, we, I didn't order one of the kits. So those will be coming and I'll reconstitute out of my own stock. Uh, good morning, Royal Nomi. How are you? Hey, Da Vinci, welcome in. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Morning, good morning, good morning. So we need some M3 by 16 flathead hex screws, AKA our counter suction. So it's a good thing I've been doing droid builds because the droid builds, well, we get a lot, you know, droid builds, death racers. Uh, we have these little packages of all of our counter sunk screws. So M3 by 16, I need four of these. And flatheads are our two millimeter screws. And I'm going to say get these all started. They're countersunk, and 
if any of your tolerances are off, once you start to seat one fully, it will adjust this plate um, based on that countersink, and it may make it hard to get others lined up. So get them all kind of started down into their countersinking where they can self-center. Just slowly work your way around. Because this will be a maining plate against the X carriage, you really want these to be fully flush and countersunk. They're not, you may have some fitment issues. Take your time, work around. Okay, take your finger over, make sure that they're all pretty flush. And then you'll notice that our, our two ball bearings stick proud. Once again, these are gonna lock on those little M3 rods that we put in place on our X carriage. Rolling away, uh-oh. And then the next step is we're gonna locate the wedge plate. So this is our little uh, plasticky part. What is this, uh, HTPE, I think. And we're gonna use M3 by six flathead hex screws as well. Um, so make sure that you grab the side that's got the countersinks in it. That's gonna be facing up. So put that part in. And once again, you do have F3 by six in the black oxide screws in your main kit. Um, don't use those. I'll have to be popping those out and swapping them out. Or replacing the stock when I get the kits from KB3D. Because you'll, you'll probably run out of them is what I'm getting at. So same thing. We're looking for alignment on this part. And we're dealing with countersunk screws. So let's go ahead and just work our way in. To all three, snugging them up, lining them up on the. Now this is at least going into the precision CNC part, which will have closer tolerances and better precision than heat set inserts into a plastic part. But as we as we bring these um, screw heads in, it will self align, and those countersink. And once again, this is where our, that little shaft, the locking shaft, will go right in there and then go vertical, and that will lock and pull the tool head off the post. So we'll take our little kit here and move that aside again. Take it easy, zombie. We'll see you later if you if you pop back in. So we're gonna pull out the Bontech tensioning gear. And you're gonna take that little plastic retainer ring off. Be careful, don't lose it. We will be putting it back on here a little bit later. Take the spring off. And then you'll have this little printed part. Right? But not very much to it. Um, you will probably have to ream this hole out with your three millimeter reamer. Just because the um like it'll go over the threaded parts, but this is basically a shoulder bolt. 
Now you'll get past the threaded parts, but you won't get over the shoulder piece, the smooth shoulder piece. So ream this part out carefully because it's fairly thin. And then this will slide over your ring piece. And even still, I've, I've reamed that out and it goes over the threads easily. And when I hit the shoulder bolt, make sure that you don't just grab it here and try and go, you'll bend it and break it. Support it, push it onto that shoulder piece and move it all the way up to the, to the base of the screw. Now you're gonna put your ring back on, find your little, uh, retainer washer, your plastic retainer washer, and get that back on the threads. You might have to thread it on. So that's now what we look like. We just we just took things apart and added another part in the mix, right? And of course, now that we have this, we're going to put it in place. And pay attention to the orientation of that black tab. If it spins around as you're tightening it, don't worry. Um, don't drop it either. Um, it's lined up. You might have to push a little bit to get your screw started. Feels like it's not straight or All right, I'm trying to figure out if I've got some fouled threads on this piece. may have a very poorly threaded heat set. Okay, it looks like we're good. 
Now your tab comes back towards the metal part. And the only thing I can think of is it seems like that's where we're going to route our wires to keep them out of the way. So just beware. Um, locate the printed part number four, this piece. And we're going to tap a hole on here for a set screw. So on the leg that comes down, there's a hole right at that little facet. We're going to tap that hole for an M3 set screw. What's going to happen is it's kind of hard to tell. But there should be a hole right there. Um, it's sort of closed up on mine, so I got have to open it back up. But that's where your um, steel spring wire is going to go in to support your your filament tube. So we're going to do that uh, tapping real fast. Yep, tap, tap, tap it. And this is not a through hole. So just beware of that. You're not going to be able to tap all the way through and get the plastic that you're cutting out. So go in for a ways, back it back out to clear the plastic out that you just cut threads in. I don't know if you guys can see that. And also kind of look about where that hole goes through and how deep it is so that you know how far to tap. That's it. Doesn't take much. But like I said, when you're when you're doing those tapping operations, this is the you know the the stuff that you're digging out. So you just need to make sure that you clean that off or clean that out so it doesn't get stuck in there. Two millimeter drill bit up because I don't need it anymore. Just trying to get some things out of the way so that I can Get those out of the way before we go any further. Went all in and won 51,000. Nice job, hybrid. Okay, now we're going to fit part four to the main body using an M3x8 flathead and an M3x10 flathead. Let me go grab my flatheads again that I thought I was done with. So the M3 by 8 is the red location. So 
So we're going on to the printed side here. So we're going to go into this heat set and this heat. So this is going to slide on there like that. We're going to do the M3 by 8 in the back. M3 by 10 down the side. And it goes without saying that it's kind of critical to get your clip coming out towards the metal side, otherwise you won't be able to get to it. And a couple things to note here, once again, you can see where the hole's supposed to be for the spring steel screw. And then we'll have the set screw that'll come from the back here. We also have holes for zip ties. We'll have our, our uh, ETFE tube coming in, be able to zip tie it. We'll have our uh, steel tube, or steel tube, our steel spring wire here. We're gonna wrap it around our PTFE tube a couple of times and make that nice, big, tall loop like you see on the Prusa exit, right? So that's there. Now we're going to locate our cooler block. So I'm going to move this out of the way again. Hopefully, I think I'm done. The next piece will be some uh, button head screws that I have in a different location. Um, so we need our Cool block. Now this is where things get a little bit different. Um, partly because uh, we're going to be installing a magnet. So in your tool block, you'll notice that it's kind of got the offset. Um, one side bigger than the other and our tool heads offset. We need to pay attention to that. And then we have a hole on one of the long uh, short faces. That's going to be uh, M the other M5 by 4 magnet that's in your FDM toolkit. Um, the polarity on that matters. Okay. And here's why we say it matters. Um, once installed, it's very difficult to remove that magnet without damaging the tool cooler block and or the magnet, right? This, this magnet is going to hit the, um, hold on a second. I'm gonna need to bring black box over here to show this. So. So, getting heavy, guys. Okay. Raise you up here. So, this M5 by 4 magnet and this cooling block, as you can see on this tool, is going to line up with this uh, magnet that we installed in the tool dock. We're going to take our magnet and just stack, you know, just let it connect there. And I'm going to take a Sharpie marker
can color that face in. So when I go to put this magnet in this block, I should not see the colored face. I should have the shiny face because this block is going to mount like this when it's all said and done. Okay, so that's why we say the polarity matters when you're putting these together. We get a couple more things out of the way here. We can get this fully up here because we'll be transitioning to working on this later. There we go. Everything up from underneath it? Yes. So, Stone <clears throat> Below is the standard pool cooler for use with a slide in heat break. Okay. On a slide in heat break, you'll have the magnet pull. And you'll have two holes for set screws. That's like the Kraken style where you've got a smooth uh, side heat break that you'll just slide in and then do the set screws. Okay. This has a threaded bore to it because we're going to use a standard E3D V6 um, uh, heat sink in here. Okay. So. We're going to press that 5x4 magnet into the bore as shown in red. Be sure the magnet is fully seated. It must be confirmed that the magnet sits either flush with or below the surface of the CNC tool cooler, meaning it needs to be flush fit here or recessed slightly. If it's standing proud, we're going to have fitment and alignment issues. Okay. Avoid the use of sharp objects. Do not, do not hammer these in. All right. We're going to use our Nipix and we're going to press fit it in. To make it easier, we can warm this block up. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to turn on the heater over on Fade Dragon and we're just going to set the bed to like 80 and we'll heat the part up. Sure, nothing's currently on the bed of feet. I'm just going to come over here and set the bed to 80. Let it start heating up. I'm going to set the block with this face that I want to press fit into, like that on the bed, and just let it heat up for a little bit. And then we'll bring that out and we'll use our Nipix pliers to press fit that in place. Now, what I'm gonna do, slide this tool head block off. I just wanna kinda of see if I can't get my fire set ahead of time so that we can start pressing that in as soon as we pull it out. That'll work. So, by the way, this is what the Revo tool head looks like. Once again, we've got the, the spring uh, heater core in, and that is a 0.6 obsidian nozzle. Um, Chris now sells the obsidian high flow. I'm trying not to spend $60 a nozzle right now and, and buy additional nozzles that I don't necessarily need, but maybe. If I want to get higher flows than what I get out of a, this is a high flow. So this is the um, 60 watt heater core versus the standard 40 watt. And you will get higher flow out of a standard or an obsidian, you know, standard nozzle or standard obsidian nozzle. Um, but if you use the high flow nozzles, which have the CHT technology in them, uh, you'll get even higher flow rates out of. So that is an option that I may swap these out. The nice thing with these is unscrew, rescrew in the next one, uh, so they're quicker changing. Once again, this face will be facing out. This is going to join on to the gantry. Um, 
in this manner. Yeah, we do our fitment test issues. Get things lined up. Um, but anyhow, this face will go up against this metal face. The cooling block will be against this metal face. So we're going to be conducting heat from this block into this metal face, into the metal face of the X gantry, and then out through the cooling system. So that's how we're going to be wicking the heat away. These two holes are four millimeter holes. Don't ream these unless you absolutely have to. You will have the ability to adjust the depth of these posts as well as un undoing the lock screws. You can kind of spread them out, push them in a little bit to get them to line up. What I did was I loosened these set screws, took this, mounted it on the um, the post, pushed it in until I heard the click from the magnets hitting, and then I tightened these back down. And that, that gave me the, the best fit right there. Um, also, you're probably gonna need to take this lower portion off and adjust the um, your little silicone pieces. Um, and we'll do that. And, and then in that next step we're going to do next week, which is the adjustment piece. And I'm just trying to let that block warm up some. Um, I did fix my worm gear drive, by the way, and get this installed. Um, my my drive gear here, my my screw drive for the worm gear, um, it had a three millimeter bore in it, and the shaft for this NEMA eight motor is a four millimeter bore. So I talked to Chris and Chris actually looked through his stock and he had a couple more that were three inch bore or three millimeter bores. So what I did was use the credit print on this, but um, I just quickly designed this block. What I did was I took the overall length and I think it was like 20 millimeters. So I just took a standard cube, 20 by 20, the bore is the the um, diameter of this worm gear is 10 millimeters. So quick Tinkercad, I took a um, 20 by 20 box, made it 25 millimeters tall, put a 10 millimeter bore in it that was 20 millimeters deep, did a four millimeter cylinder. Uh, Cut out cylinder, and I centered all three of those on the center part and the top plane. Now the 10 millimeter uh, cylinder is only 20 millimeters high, which is the length of that worm drive gear. So there is a step in there; it doesn't go all the way down in there. And that four millimeter went all the way through. I also put a slight cutout here. So I could put an M3 by 10 screw in here to keep it from turning if it if it wasn't a tight press fit. It was a tight press fit. So I put the bore in here with the set screw, of course, at this side. Put my 10 millimeter long screw in there. And then that enabled me to take it, hold it in the vise, and use my drill press through the center hole here for four millimeters and that helped make sure that my bore was straight and perpendicular so I don't have a, a cattywampus rotation. And then after I drilled it with four millimeter, I went back in with the four millimeter reamer to make sure it was clear, clean, and truly concentric. And that was it, it slipped right on, no problems. 
Um, worm gears are weird. You're never going to be able to drive through this round gear or from the tool. You have to rotate this screw drive because there's a, 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 normal, a normal gear, right? This edge is essentially flat. On a worm gear, there's a helical cut in this. So each ridge is actually cut concave, right? So you actually have to drive this screw for this gear to move. So it's really hard. About the only way I could try and verify that I had a tight fit but movement was to gently with a pair of needle nose pliers grab the bore and the edge and just test it. So, but yeah, quick, quick little bend up jig that allowed me to, to drill that bore so that Chris didn't have to overnight me a little brass part. All right, so this is heated up a little bit. We're gonna take our magnet off. And once again, our black face, the one we put painted with our Sharpie, goes down in there. We're gonna get it started in the hole, or at least align with the hole. Take our Nipix pliers. And gently and slowly press. Once again, you do not want to put hard impact in here. And I would highly suggest putting your, your hand and fingers over it in case that magnet does shatter. You don't want shards of this magnet shooting everywhere that can get in your eyes and stuff like that. So gently, gently press that magnet in. I think that's all the travel I had. So let me ratchet this down one more step. Almost there. Okay, and we're there, we're nice and flush because once again, smooth jaw pliers, we're gonna guarantee that we're gonna be flush across the face of that. Um, maybe still a tad proud, so let's give it a, one more squeeze. There we go. That's good, nice and flat across that top surface. We didn't mar this very much. We got we got a little bit, but if I had used some regular jaw pliers, we would have had all kinds of tore up ridges there. And that would be bad because this surface is what's going up against this plate to provide cooling. So we don't want this surface to have ridges and mars because then it's not going to sit flush and we're going to get bad heat conductivity through those parts. Once again, we'll move this out of the way. I'm going to take this and we're just going to test it. Yep. 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 It, it, it holds. Right? So that's good now. Um, now this particular block is, once again, for an E3D uh, M6 thread heat break. So I'm going to Pick this up and put it back down so we can finish building it. And that is getting heavier and heavier. Hey, make her mind. So, let me go ahead and pull that back down. 
So we've got that magnet press fit in. Once again, we won't have these two uh, set screw holes on here because this is a threaded heat break, not a, uh, a Kraken or I think like an Ender 3 style where you have the set screw that holds that smooth board or smooth outside board heat break in. It was in your pillowcase. That's interesting. Sorry about that. We're going to secure this loosely to the main tool body with some M3 by 18 button head screws. Um, just thinking real fast. Um, and we're going to prepare a short length of Bowden tubing between the heat brake and the tool body. Um, note here, this is not applicable to the Revos because they have the long heat brake as part of the overall nozzle. What we're trying to do is set the, um, the amount of, of a PTFE tube that needs to be in here into the heat brake. Now we do have some standard lengths. So for the smooth bore, Cooler block, Kraken or Chimera, you'll need 12.8 millimeters. For the threaded tool cooler block, uh, E3D titanium heat break, you'll need 13.2. Um, that is what I have. And I have a little bit of PTFE tube here. So we'll do that. We'll grab our calipers so zeroed out and we're going to be looking for 13.2 on the nose. That's how much PTFE tube we're going to uh, cut. So just make sure that you're as straight as possible on your tube. We will mark this. A couple of ways you can do it. You can try and go through here. I'm going to go to the depth gauge side. So I can put this right up against the depth gauge and mark my PTFE tube and that's where I'll cut it Okay, so small little piece of PTFE tube. Yeah, well, I get that. The goal here is to completely fill the void in the filament path with the length of Bowden tube without causing the tube to collapse or deform due to too much length of material. We don't want to compress that tube 
which will cause it to have issues. Now, it doesn't say it in this, and this is the two millimeter inside diameter. Do not use your three millimeter inside diameter for Do you want the constraint here? Once again, we're going to take our, our deburring counterboring tool, and we're going to chamfer both ends just a little bit. This will help guide the tube through, or the uh, filament through the tube. And also, if we are just a little bit long and it compresses, it can compress this ends or both ends without impacting the actual tube itself and causing the problems that we were trying to mitigate. Make sure you clear out any loose strands of PTFE. I'm just taking a piece of filament, running it through there, making sure that there's no little pinging pads on that PTFE tube. Okay. So that's prepared. We're going to insert the previous cut length of bone tube into the main tool body and make sure it's fully seated. The cutaway shows the correct location for the tube when fully assembled. Um, why wouldn't we just take this and shove it in that hole right there? And also, your tube's four millimeters, so if need be, and your print has got a bit of an overhang there, reamer. Gently by hand. Because once again, you, you tend to, on overhangs, it's not going to be perfectly round. You'll get a tad bit of an overhang. So we just cleared that up with a reamer. We're going to take that tube, press it in. As far as we can get it. Then your block is going to get a lot. There we go. So I don't have these M3 by 18 button heads. The closest I've got is either 14, I think it's 14 or, I don't know, what do I got? Sixteen. Sixteen is the closest I have. Anything other than that is 25. So I, like I said, I've got the, Faster kits on order, so those will come in. I'll go like that. That allow me to loosely set these on. Okay. So we've got our PTFE tube in there. Long story short, the PTFE tube is going right in this area here. Now, you, so you did see that it is sitting proud of the printed part some, and that's because it will go down into the titanium heat break just a little bit. Now, what we're going to do is we need to apply a light coat of our thermal paste to our um, 
heat break and the thermal pace I think is still over here. That was thermal pace was in the miscellaneous box, right? And if we remember, it says lightly coat, a little bit of thermal paste, lightly coat. Last time we tried to lightly coat anything, it made a huge mess. So, we're going to grab our little plastic lids here. This is just for uh, like, uh, I don't know, little cups. Hey, West 3, how's it going? Welcome in. And we're going to attempt to squirt just a little bit of our borosilicate paste out. And that's what I'm saying is there is no little. Once this plunger goes, it goes. And this is more liquidy than pasty. So I'm not sure if I necessarily like this over standard like CPU thermal paste. So we got paste out. We need to get our um, heat break stuff out, which is here. We've got a few things that I bought. We've got our titanium heat break. Oh, ad break in progress. So this, the smaller portion is the portion that goes up against the nozzle. And there's your actual heat break itself. This is the main throat. These are the threads that we're gonna put our paste on. And then you can see there's a bit of a, a counterboard area and that's the top portion where your PTFE tube is going to go down into the top of your heat your throat there, right? So we need a little bit of our borosilicate. We're gonna use our little adapter or our dabber here. Get some of our borosilicate and we're going to get it on these threads here. We don't need them on the lower threads. We just need them on the upper threads. And you don't really need to cut it all the way around, I don't think, but I'm going to because there's just no easy way to just do a certain part of these. But you can think of this operation right here as kind of like putting Teflon tape on the threads of a plumbing fixture, except there you're trying to prevent whatever liquids going through said plumbing fixture from, from escaping. Here we're trying to get a good thermal connectivity across the threads into the heat block or the cooling block. So we're using this to wick the heat away through the block. This porosilicate paste gets everywhere. Okay. So once again, let me look at my alignments and which way is going which. So Looking at the printed part here and our block, the small side goes to the right. So this is the way we're putting in our heat break. We're gonna take that and we're gonna start screwing it in from the bottom up.
And you want to go from the bottom up, not, not from the top down, because what you would do going the other way is potentially bringing this, this excess material up and into your, your Bowden tube or your, uh, your filament path, which you do not want. But what you do want is for that, for those threads to be fully engaged. And I'll show you what I mean here in one second. Let me clean up this excess paste. So our threads are fully engaged, but they're not sunken down into the heat blankets. Um, that's what you want is full thread engagement without going down into your, your actual heat block. So that's part one. Now what we'll do is we will take this assembly with our throat. I'm going to line that back up on our PTFE tube. I'm going to take my M3 by 16, so my two short screws. And we're going to push this block down and tighten it up. That's what we're seeing. Now we're going to thread on the heat block using the image below for height reference, showing the ideal final location of the heat block. Not shown here. We will not, oh, we will also now install the heater cartridge, blah, 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 even though the heater cartridge is not necessarily shown in this part. Um, we can and probably should put a little bit more of this paste on, but be very careful and stay towards the top of your threads. I'm not going to get it down where it can be pulled into and foul our, our filament path, like I said before. Once again, this is just going to provide additional thermal connectivity. And by not going down to the end threads, as I thread on my heat block next, it's not going to foul that filament pad. If anything, the excess material will get pushed up to the top. So I am using a nickel plated. Copper E3D uh, heater brake here. And you'll see we, we would prefer really like to have our E3D visible. But we're going to take this. Thread it on. Now I'm not going to thread it all the way through just yet. Because what we're going to want to do, take our nozzle, in this case our nozzle is a slice engineering vanadium nozzle, 0.6 as well. So I'm going to take this and screw this in.
And the way I normally do these is I take it in and I bottom it out. Then I'm going to take it and rotate it one full turn. So six is showing against the uh, the thermistor heat set. I'm going to turn that around. Oh, six is showing. So I have one full turn of threads exposed. Now I'm going to tighten my heat block. So that heat block is now lined at a 90 degree with my block down here. And now I have one full thread to tighten my nozzle up against the heater core. Okay. So before proceeding, take a moment now to ensure the filament enters and exits the gear smoothly. So I probably should have done that before I put my nozzle in. We'll go ahead and unscrew the nozzle. We're going to take our filament, come in from the top. We should be able to get through our gears. I have to uh, do the old open the gears up. I miss. Really? Or remove it. Trying to open the gears up without putting my shirt on the heat block and getting stuff everywhere. But I can move the gear here, which will move the filament down through the heat block slowly. Use the tension on the thumb. So if you need to, bring loose, see where you're catching. In gear one. Element is when it's straight and that's part of what's There we go. There's more of just the filament tip. Pretty tight fit, but you want to make sure that your filament comes all the way through. It does. And where it's catching is going back into the printed part right past the gear. It's just a tight fit. And it depends on your tip being decent and not crappy. Leave that off for the time being. Get our headline back up. 
Put in our nozzle again. And once again, you're seeing a gap between the nozzle and the heat block. Do not want your nozzle bottomed out on your heat block. Because if it bottoms out on the heat block, there's no way that you can be tight up against your, um, you can't guarantee that you'll be tight against your heat break. So right now, I've twisted by hand and I am coming up against the, um, the heat break or the throat and the heat break. So I know that I'm good and tight. Now what I need to do is install the nozzle and torque it against the heat break. So this is where we want to Torque this nozzle some, not a lot. This is a titanium heat break. If you crank on that real hard, you will snap your heat break. That is a thin walled heat break. Let me go get one of my appropriate wrenches. Guarantee it's this one. This one should be. If not, Of fate has come to the rescue. Well, that one won't work, so. Are these vanadium nozzles? Like I thought they were the same as the B6. Apparently they uh they might be a little bit um smaller. Well, they're gonna make me try and think. Wrenches me. Good. All righty, I guess we're going to be having fun. By fun, I mean fun. So, you can hold the heat block. What I'm going to do is we're vertical here. I'm going to use a one, two, three block to keep me from twisting that heat block. Probably don't do it this way. I'm going to use my pliers. And I'm going to do a preliminary torquing. Once again, I'm not trying to crank down. I'm just trying to get a good press friction fit against the nozzle and the heat brake. Because what you should always do on parts like this is heat up the, the hot end in the nozzle to 285, grab hold of it with a wrench and another wrench, and then torque it down to final spec with heat in place. We don't have heat right now, so we're cold tightening it versus hot tightening. So just be aware of that and that know that you're gonna have to do another true tightening once we get the whole thing set up, okay? Oh, 
Um, yeah, no, no impact wrench on your tool head. Uh, I guarantee you, you will be replacing parts if you do that. Um, so I didn't even think about that. That is a slice engineering nozzle. <laughs> so I probably could have ordered the slice specific wrench and it would have worked. But I, I don't know why that nozzle size is different. Like I've, I mean, hell, this is the wrench off the mini. That's huge. So, oh well. But by using, by having this sitting down flat and then having my one, two, three block here, it made sure that my heat block is straight so that I should be planed appropriately here. So I'm not going to have an issue with this fouling against anything it needs to attach to. Um, That may not. That's coming in the adjustment the adjustment time. So once again, here you'll see maintain a gap between the hot block and the cold block. Maintain a gap between the hot block and the nozzle face. When fully tightened, be sure the heater block is nicely square. Do not install any silicon socks or boots at this time. So once again, we're looking for an even gap. And there needs to be a gap here and a gap between your nozzle and the heat block. And everything nice and flush and square. And that is the end of the tool section. Now we would install a, a heater and a thermistor. I'm going to do that later off stream. Uh, it's excess wires, I'll just be flopping all over the place. I do have some. I think 60 watt, 24 volt heaters for this and thermistors. Um, I've got those in spades, so that's no big deal. And we will test fit this onto the post. But first, I'm going to clean up some things. I'm going to need to keep this. I might need some more of these things because this will have my little set screws for the uh, thermistor and the heat blocks and stuff. This stuff can go in the garbage for now. We will put away our uh, reamers. This is one. That one. And that one. All right. Put these away. This is going to get thrown away. This is going to go in my, when I said I had a bag of them. I mean, I have a bag of them. Oh, yeah. Special text that would use impact. Oh, yeah. 1,400 pounds of torque on brass or aluminum. Uh, that would easily get you into a uh, an opportunity to remake parts real fast. Um, let me just put some things out of the way real fast, and then we'll bring the printer up. And once again, we're skipping part 7B, um, which is fitment testing and alignment and things like that. We're going to set this aside because we'll use our spring steel wire. We'll use that in another step. So like I said, I've got two more uh, Revo hot ends to do. And we'll do that on another stream. I won't need this anymore because we don't use the um, this stuff on Revo hot ends. I'm gonna let that sit over there and dry out. 
or throw it away in the main garbage can that has a bag in it. Mix that and get that out of the way. Got our tool head. We'll add it to the printer here in a second. But we're going to switch over and go into section eight, which is mounting of the electronics. So reamers, drill, hex wrench, soldering iron, heat set inserts, yay, and plenty of various parts. Lots of printed parts. A few jigs, a few uh, installation tools, but a lot of printed parts. And we'll get into our den brack. Black box makes use of den rails and clips for easy service and configuration by simply removing the floor panels. Uh, and we're going to put some of these things in place here next. So, uh, tool head, I'll scoot that over here. We'll get black box up here. I'm going to remove the, like, several pounds of heated bed. We're just going to set that over here out of the way. No need of continuing to lift that up, too. Um. So we've got one tool head. Whoop. Got one tool head in place here already. Tool head number two. Take that and we'll set it in here on its posts. That's not lining up. Apparently the spacing may be off. Oh yeah, spacing's off for getting into the docks. Is I was gonna say, is there supposed to be space? There's no space there. Maybe I just need to add additional tension to the screw because that's really what it is, is the screws um, aren't letting this line up on the post. So I just need to screw in my tensioner a bit more. Feels like a hell of a lot of tension. Yeah, Chris, these, uh, that's how they're going to go in. Magnets are hitting. Um, we will need to adjust these. I'm going to adjust these two all the way down like I did over here. And then we'll adjust them up as we need to. And by these, I mean the little silicone wipers. Um, yeah, Chris, I was going to say, does there need to be spaces between here? But there can't be because... The two lower screws that mount the wiper to the aluminum bar and then also go through the aluminum bar into this docking piece. I mean, that is the spacing. You can't change that spacing because it's CNC'd in. But the that tension spring would be in the way of these lining up properly. Unless I put a heck of a lot more tension on there. Right, so that's hitting down here on the wipers, so I'd have to move those. So it clears the back part, but ooh. No. That's interesting. So it would hit, it would pull on the tool, but right here it's still on the on the post, but it's hitting the uh, I guess that'll be fitment time on the next stream. We'll get into fitment. So what's happening is this screw, one, I've got a lot of tension on it, but it's got clearance between the printed part, but you'll see. Each side of this printed part angles out. 
And so it would catch here on the angle part before it gets off of the posts. So either my posts need to be pushed back further or something else needs to be worked on. But that'll be part of next week's stream when we get into adjusting the fitment of these. Um, but right now everything's on there for those two tools. And we're going to start doing our um, electronics mounting. And I think we actually build all the brackets before we need the printer up here. So let me put this back down on the ground and out of the way. So this would be the next big part where we've got various brackets. I'm going to get out all the what looks like an electronic mounting bracket first, because those are going to be the first things that we're installing or prepping. Pin rail mount itself. Pin rail mount. Gin rail, gin rail. That'll get us started. The rest we'll grab in a minute or two. Okay, so we've got some basic parts here. We're going to need our din rails. So base, the majority of the din rails are all in a box. Or did I? No, I pulled them all out of the box. That's good. That makes life easier. So where on the borons and stuff, we tend to use, oh, what we got here? Back from the boys' swim lessons, nice. Headed out to finish wiring the new shop. Okay, cool. Yeah, at some point, Chris, I may need to drive up there, maybe on a long weekend and just check out the new shop. I know the shop's not open, but hopefully I could weasel my way in for a shop tour. Oh, BC, know me. Thank you. Uh, 100 bits and then 101 bits, 100 bits, 200 bits. Wow. Thank you, know me and BC for all of the biddies. That's awesome. We got a hype train started. Just something with the hype train starting. Westery lurking. Little robot taking your wife out to lunch. Good on you, my friend. Uh, Westry cheered 100 bits before she went on the lurk. Thank you for all the bits, everybody. Mr. Wizix, 200 bits, thanks. Sharing the love. Well, thank you. Thank you, BC and Royal Nomi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you guys are going to Rocky Mountain, correct? Hope so. If I remember right, you are. So as I was starting to say, um, borons, we normally print out the DIN rail mounts themselves. And we only use these metal mounting points for the actual SSRs. Well, here we're using these metal mounts for all of our DIN mountings. So we'll have our power supply, our boards for the, uh, for the duet boards. Um, we'll have a couple of step down buck converters. We'll have a Raspberry Pi mount, I believe. And we'll have a uh, the actual SSR. So lots of little bags if you need more little bags. Some of these I'm keeping, some of them I'm not. Uh, you, you never can tell when you're going to need little bags for something, whether it's shipping something to somebody or prepping, you know, screws, bits, or bobs, or printed parts for operations. So keep a few of those. All right, you still have to book the hotel? Okay. Yeah, I'm booked into the embassy suite, so 
I'll be right there across the venue. Flyers out of the way. So I'm gonna get this started or this taken apart so we can use it because I did see it. We're gonna have to do some heat sets and we're gonna be using various uh, screws here. So right now we're gonna start with our power supply mount. So we'll have our power supply DIN rail and we'll need M4 by eight socket head cap screws. Four of those. Nice. And more bits. Thank you, BC and Royal Nomi. Um, and there is a smooth side and then ones that allow the heads to countersink in there. So that's the ones you want to have facing up. We'll take one of your parts or one of your uh, pieces. And this is a symmetrical part, so it really doesn't matter which way you have it going, but there will be parts that we have to have the den rails oriented in a specific way. Just be aware of that. That's called out in the manual, so. So thank you for the hype, and thank you for all of the biddies there, BC, Mr. Wizix, and everyone else. We're, I'm starting to get excited for Rocky Mountain, and I'll say Mrs. Dragon's getting excited as well. Um, she's already like booking a hotel room for her family as well, because her mom and brother are going to come up with her. Um, so we'll have the whole gang there. Now, Mrs. Dragon was going to do the battle bots, which I guess. We did find out that they are going to have the battle bots, but we're trying to figure out if the battle bot I was planning on building will be authorized for what they're running at the show. If not, I'll have to build a different one. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll get that figured out and get that going. We will have a death racer. We're not bringing the um, the dragster. At least I'm not planning on it at this point. Yeah, excited for the break from life. Exactly. Too many things going on, too many changes right now. So I, I feel you there. We're going to position the power supply on the mount and secure with four M4 by 12 socket heads. Um, so we'll find our power supply. And this is a good time to check. From the factory, it says 230, so we're just going to flip that over to 110. Seriously. Now we're at 115 volts. We'll kind of look at how they've got it laid out there. So our longer arm end is just looking at the manual of the depressions. Our push part goes where our, our uh, mounting lugs are for our wires. M4 by 12.
these down some. Okay, so that part's there. Next will be the Raspberry Pi mount. So we need to install some heat set inserts and these are gonna be the M2 heat set inserts into the four corners. Um, gonna be fun. That stuff to the side. We'll bring this up. Luckily, we're cooled down so we can take off of the M3 heat set insert and put on the two. Yeah, thanks for the hype train, everybody. I appreciate that. We had a level one at 39% with 620 bits. Thank you very much. Every little bit helped especially to get us to the various shows and stuff. We're gonna put our M2 heat set on. And we'll grab our M2 heat set insert. Things are so tiny. And make sure they're nice and flush. I'm going to kind of leave this here for now because I don't know if we're going to wind up needing them again. And I want to switch over to the three before I put it back down. We've got our four heat sets in. We're going to secure the den rail mount. It's not going to matter in which direction. We're going to need some M4 by 6 socket head screws. Once again, this part is symmetrical, so it doesn't matter, uh, you know, which way the hip piece is. Hey, Hobby Main, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. We've made some progress. So I had built the tool head last night to test out all the processes and I had 
come across a couple of issues and, and worked with Chris last night to get those squared away. And some of those issues just being I hadn't purchased all the parts I needed to purchase, um, meaning I didn't buy the fastener kit that I needed for each tool head. So I've got those on order and Chris will be sending those out uh, sometime next week to me. And then we got, so we built the tool last night, or I built the tool last night, which was a Revo hot end. And today we put together our E3D V6 hot end. I've got two more Revos to, to build, but I will do those off stream. And, um, So this is basically what each of our tool heads will look like. This is the side with the two holes that will mount on our dock. This cold side has a magnet in it that's going to attach to the cold side bar that we added to the uh, tool mounts last stream. And then this side, these are the two uh, locating balls that will locate on the front face. And then this side here, we will have to adjust so it's sitting flat against that X plate because this is how we're going to transfer that heat off to the X plate while it's actually printing with the tool head. So pretty nice setup. It's uh, so far everything's lining up. I might need to do some adjustments, but that'll be the next stream where we go through and we adjust each of the tool heads. What we're doing right now is just prepping all of our electronics mount. So we need a Raspberry Pi for this. Um, what do you guys think? A Raspberry Pi 2 gig? Excuse me, a Raspberry Pi 4 2 gig? A Raspberry Pi 8 gig? So I've got both of these Raspberry Pi 4s. We can go with a 2 gig or an 8 gig. Um, I also have a Big Tree Tech Pi with a CB1 module. Now, I don't necessarily want to put those in because I know they've got newer versions coming out. And I have some Lieber Elect boards that we can put in. Um, but I think for the tool changer, I want to stick with Raspberry Pi. And it's the tool changer. So we're going to put the uh, 8 gig in. Yeah. You're excited? The Ender. 3 v 3 ke you went from Sam Prentice just got here. Awesome. Nice. So, standard Raspberry Pi stuff. Uh, yep, that goes there. Um, we've got a Raspberry Pi board. It's 8 gig of RAM. We will add uh, some heat sinks and stuff on this. I'll do that a little bit later. Kind of no real need to do it. I believe we're going to put this on with M2 by 8 socket head cap screws. And it's not showing anything extending out this side. So this part must be the part that goes up underneath the ports. So we'll mount it like this versus like that. So we need some M2 by 8. Once again, these guys are tiny, so be careful with them. Hey, Lucas Player, how's it going? Please use our 1.5 driver. Mm 
And so once again, these are heat set, inserted into plastic parts. So don't, don't tighten all these down until you get all four started, just so you can ease it through any alignment issues. Because these are not like, you know, precision CNC'd mounts. Well, that could be an option down the road. I really wanted to. Because we will have a Milo on the way from KB3D. Uh, I purchased, I pre-ordered it. Um, but once it comes in, I'll, I'll get that shipped. I'm not expecting that to get here before uh, Rocky Mountain, though. So for future, Chris, I believe we have M2 by 6 in the kit. And I think M2 by 6 would work perfect here rather than the 8. Just because these are 8 millimeter fine pitch and they just take forever to screw in. So a few less millimeter to work through would be nice. I mean, the board itself looks like it's about two millimeters thick, so I'd still give you four millimeters into your heat set. But nice sturdy mount, so Raspberry Pi done. Next up, um, solid state relay, so I gotta dig that out. Duet. 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 Oh, the state really. That's what we're Now, this is where a lot of things in the box start disappearing and things start getting a lot. Uh, just, we're we're going to find a lot more space. There's going to be a lot more on the printer and a lot less in the box. So solid state relay, we're going to need some M4 by 6s. They really don't say which way to mount this, but it's two screws. If we need to, we can flip it around. Chances are we'll be taking one, at least one of these screws out anyhow to add a ground. All the state relay done. The DC converter, we're going to need M3 heat sets. I had a feeling we we're going to use M3 again. Hey, Major Gamer Geek, good morning. Welcome in. Welcome in. Hope everybody's doing good. We're just going through and setting up all the electronics mounts. Um, having to do some heat set inserts in the process. So um, swapping some tips out right now so that we can do some M3s. And it said it kind of refers to it as one. We're actually there's two, so we're actually going to put heat certs in two. And the heat sets are going in on the sides that have the counter bores. So we'll need our M3 heat sets, eight of them. Mayhem. Hey, hey, hey. 
thought you lost your desktop PC, where'd it run off to? I'm assuming you're talking about you thought that you almost uh, power spiked it. Okay, so we're up to temp. Go ahead and get these four set. So we're doing good on black box. We're going to have a lot of content on black box, you know, and it's tool changing stuff. And black box will be coming with us to Murph and 3D Printopia this year. Um, I won't be bringing it to Rocky Mountain just because I'm going to be space constrained to bring black box it'll be the only printer coming with me and what i really want to do is bring a couple of printers that may find new homes at rocky mountain so if you're looking for a printer and you like the work that i do you may have an opportunity to pick one up at rocky mountain Um, but in doing so, we're also going to make room for a couple of other projects. Like I said, we have a Milo uh, 1.5, so the Millennium Mill Milo is coming, and I've already got parts. I was going to start building the Casa enclosure ahead of the kit getting here. And they just released a new revision of the Casa enclosure. So may have to buy some additional extrusion material to actually build the Casa V2 enclosure for it. And the Millennium Mill will wind up out in the garage. So we may do some build up here. And then at some point we may have to set up uh, out in the garage. For some milling, which means I'll have to clean up my garage. Um, but we have a Milo that's coming that I'm not sure. It probably, actually, they're not going to get here before Rocky Mountain because the, the kits aren't even a KB3D. So they're not getting shipped out most likely before Rocky Mountain because I don't think I think they're they're not even going to be here till Rocky Mountain if I remember right. Um, and then we have Milo will get, we'll have a VZBot 235 on its way. So we'll have another, we'll say, uh, uh, high spec printer because that will be all wheel drive. It will have a mixture of 24 and 48 volt power to it. Um, so another fun, fairly complex build, another tank of a machine. So, okay, so we did the, ins the heat set inserts, uh, put these on DIN rails with M4 by sixes, M4 by sixes. And the, the spring-loaded part comes out on the short part, not where the where the little ear wings are.
and lifted the back of it to get a cord out and it turned over with, oh. Okay, hopefully you have a backup or you can do a backup. I would be doing a backup at this point. Hey, Hobby Mine or Hobby Main. Uh, you're doing well today. Going through another ad break. I've got both of those mounts prepped. I'm assuming the next up is we're going to actually mount the parts that go on them. The two DC converters. And I got to find those. Um, The misc other, which means it's in the electronics. Could be. Yep, there we go. I need the rest of that stuff later. So we have a 12, 24 volt to 5 volt 10 amp. And a 24 volt to 12 volt 10 amp. So basically, one buck down to 12, and another one that is 12 or 24 volt input down to 5 volt. And if you're familiar with like boron V0s, They were using one of these. I think I've I've always used like Obson. These are day greens. This takes uh, 12 or 24 volt on the left two plugs and drops it down to five volt or 10 amp on the right two. We're gonna mount these two up using M3 by six screws. And it might be worth your while if you have a label maker to actually make a label, you know, like black on white that says, uh, or any color on white that says, uh, you know, 5 volt or 12 volt, um, just so it's easier and, and more prevalent. Because these do, at first glance, look exactly the same. And wiring a 5 volt component up to a 12 volt would probably end spectacularly. If 
like it would almost be better as well if you know you could do it by you know these printed parts even being a different color picking a, uh, an alternate color for low voltage Just something to help you when you're building and wiring and maintenance later on, not to let out the evil people. There you go. I like to hear that. Backups are already started. Yep. And folks, I know that there's been a lot of other content creators bringing this up um, and it's been all over Twitter and I'm going to bring it up as well. And you'll probably see me weigh in on Twitter later today. But one of our fellow content creators, Nero3D, was actually doing a birthday stream uh, Friday and was showing off his prop. Uh, gun for his Helldivers cosplay he's working on and YouTube killed his stream and has banned him for like 60 or 90 days. Now it's obviously a printed part. It's held together with paint because he hasn't actually put it together and it has a pink scope. Like it's multicolored print. It's obviously not a working functioning thing and their algorithm or potentially an individual who is reviewing the live streams uh, not only killed his stream, but banned him for like 60 or 90 days. So let's, let's all jump on the bandwagon and help. Any one of us that are content creators can be banned at any point in time. And it doesn't necessarily hurt people like me because I don't make my living this way. But people like Nero3D, like he's been streaming for a year and, and he quit his other job. He used to be, uh, I'll say like a machinist that was working on big cool dies doing like auto bumpers and stuff like that. Um, and he went full-time streaming. So he was monetized on YouTube and has now lost his entire uh, you know, income. Hey, Pete, welcome on in. So if you're on the socials, please just jump on there and help out uh, Nero. We all know what happened to 3D Print General. Um, it, this isn't right. You know, you can clearly tell that things are cosplay props. Um, let, let's, let's support our own. Right, and I understand that there's people in the world that are doing the wrong things and printing things they shouldn't be. This is not that case. Um, now we're gonna be going into some M4 heat sets, so we gotta do another heat sweat swap. He's not demonetized completely, but he's banned for 60 to 90 days. So for three months, he's not gonna be able to make money off of streams because he can't do streams. He can't post videos. He's basically blocked on the platform for 60 to 90 days, and that's gonna hurt his numbers. Um, oh, did they finally unblock him? Well, I think his page should come up and you can still get to his existing content, but I don't know if he can actually make any new content right now. Yeah, see, that's the bad thing is he can't live stream and, I, and I'm not sure if he can actually post any standard videos either. I think he can't post any more content for like 60 to 90 days. So, I, and I don't want to get into the, you know, thing other than, you know, reach out to Google or not Google, uh, reach out to YouTube. You know, po he, he's got a post out there on YouTube retweet or jump on that post and and let's 
let's put them on blast. You know, yes, there are some people that are doing, which kills me. I've seen people with content printing full lowers on YouTube, and they're not being banned. But somebody showing a, a full cosplay uh, rifle that's being held together by Peter's tape is getting banned. Yet I see a guy in there talking about printing lowers and bump stocks while you still can. I'm like, that's, yeah. Don't even get me started. Um, you know, I know everybody, and it's, it's some politics there, so I don't want to get political discussions, but, you know, the, the gist is we have a content creator that was doing cosplay, showed off some of his cosplay stuff, and they banned him from the platform for 60 or 90 days. And that's his only, um, that's his only source of income other than his wife's job. So that's the impact, right? And he's trying to appeal it, and the appeal is being denied once again. And I don't think it's... It's it's a um, it's not a human I don't believe that is reviewing it. So, you know, he was flagged most likely by AI, and his appeal is being denied by AI. So, yeah. Yeah, so I don't want to say that Nero is, he may be blocking you, Pete, I don't know. I do know that I have, re I have reached out to Nero on a couple of things and he hasn't responded to me. But when I walk up and talk to him, it shows. You know, he acknowledges me, we talk some. So I think he knows me, but I, I don't think that he really engages with a lot of people kind of like we do, right? Um, and some of that's just his family life, private life type stuff, you know? Um, so these are our M4 inserts and we're putting these in the four corners of our duet and our, I'm gonna, I believe it's gonna be on both boards, bigger one and the smaller one, yep. Or no. One mount. Here are the three C. I just want to make sure that both boards are using M4s and they are. So we're going to go through and do both boards at the same time. And yeah, and then like Liz on her stream last night, she had somebody with an unlisted number that kept calling her during her stream. She would, she would ignore the call and they would dial her right back up. So, you know, be mindful of people, be nice to people. If they're streaming, don't, don't heckle them during a stream. Now, I mean, if you're texting somebody to say like, hey, Luke, hey, Nero, hey, so-and-so, um, you're, you're hot mic'd when well, I think that I'm supposed to not be hot mic'd or if you're, you're trying to send me a link because I can't, you can't send me links in chat or something and you have that number and you know me and we have a relationship already, that's one thing. But, you know, don't just be reaching out to people while they're streaming. It was also ridiculous, you know?
down those M2s and M3s, you kind of see the step down, so it makes it easier to, to know when you're getting close to having it fully seated. On this M4, it's pretty much like almost a straight shaft. Yeah, I have to like get down here and really look to make sure that I'm getting close. Once again, that last little bit, I want to push in to make sure it's flush and then just kind of move it around on the edge here to burnish any of the uh, overflow. And I'll be honest, I don't know if, if it was somebody that was active in Pez's stream or, you know, for all I know, it could have been, you know, some local government person or, you know, I, who knows. But just don't do that. Be a bigger person and just don't engage at all, you know. Like we know there's certain people in our... Uh, community or or stuff, and I'm and you you see me saying certain person in our community that uh, it is not invited, and in fact has been told explicitly not to show up at certain events, um, just because their attitude within the community and on their social platform is very um aggressive and it just not needed period you know so let's be good to each other let's let's be nice to each other we're all in this together let's just keep moving forward okay so we've got both of these mounts started we've got the big one we got the small one we're going to mount these on the DIN rail and the smaller one, we're gonna mount with two M4 by six screws. Not sure the larger one, we might wind up with four screws in it just because it's, it'll be a bigger board. And once again, it's a symmetrical mount, so it doesn't matter in which orientation you do it. Okay, move that one. I'm going to go ahead and do the other mountain and bring the boards. Up. Ooh, yeah. Once again, this this part is also symmetrical, so we just need to line it up and get our corner four corner holes going. Yeah, and that's the thing is is there there was good content. And I liked the 
the actual content discussion. It was the the attitude that came with it that I've now blocked that individual on all socials because I just I, I don't want to deal with the the attitude and the angst towards everybody in the community. And if you even rise and say something, say like, hey, please don't please don't talk to me or talk about me like that, then then they just keep going, right? And so it's 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 one of those things it's kind of pointless to engage because it just continues the argument. All right, so we've got some duet boxes. And our duet EB three three H C right? We've got an EB three H C six H C and then the, the panel do so. I don't think we'll be dealing with the panel do just yet. But as you can tell, we get a plethora of connectors. So we will have plenty of connectors to play with. Um, kind of hoping Lineo comes through with a pre made wiring harness. I'm sure we'll wind up with duet stickers in each and every board. So. We'll have plenty of duet stickers to put around. Especially since we will be also doing the Milo, which, or no, that uses the Mellow Fly boards, not the, the actual duet boards. It runs RepRap firmware, but it's, it's not duet hardware. So we will pay attention to how this mounts. Does say note the orientation. So we'll see the way it's set. This is the springy mechanism. So that's the side that we need our screw down terminals and our Ethernet ports pointed toward. So it's going to mount like this. And we're going to use M4 by 6 socket head screws. And I've had people like that, like in my own work industry, which is cybersecurity, that, you know, they've got a good message, but it gets lost in how it's communicated. Um, And, you know, as I've mentioned and noted before, I've never used RepRap firmware or Duet. So this is going to be new to me. I've been watching a lot of the Milo builds and seeing people dealing with Duet firmware or RepRap firmware, as well as um, Or version okay CD. okay so this this sticker here is the same one here this is just a serial number i'm just trying to make sure if there was any information on these i needed to keep or if i awesome so there's our our smaller duet board and then this is going to be the big daddy and once again we've got our powered by duet sticker and our other powered by duet sticker. So I got stickers. And once again, connectors, pins. We'll have plenty of pins and connectors. We have the cable that will go between this board and the uh the three the expansion board, three EH, three H D, whatever it is. Model number. And so this will get mounted. And yes, this was already opened up. I had already opened up and took a look at it. Do duet boards run Clipper? I think you can put Clipper on duet boards. I think. 
Um, but these are very nice boards. They've got, uh, this is the 6HC, so six channel high current. This will have six motors. The other one has uh, three motor options on it, and they are all. I gotta get my my old man eyes going here. Silk screen and tiny parts. EMC twenty one sixty are the stepper drivers. Twenty one sixties are the stepper drivers on both boards. So those are all high current. Um and I've never run a twenty one sixty. I know that they are they are I'll say the stock on all the duet boards and have been for a while. Um No, let me take that back. Does what stepper does the Einsi boards use? Do they use twenty one sixties, twenty one forties? Hey Retro Make TV, how's it going? If somebody would be so kind as to look that up, I would be very appreciative. What what stepper motor or stepper drivers come on? The Einsi and Buddy boards from Prusa. Once again, we need to look at orientation, and the orientation is our screw down terminals need to be aligned with the springy push clip. So we'll get this on there, and once again, we'll just start our four screws and then. Tighten it down once we get them all on there. Doing good, uh, Retro. Doing good. Hey, Zombie, how's it going? Actually, it's less than a month if you're talking about seeing them at Rocky Mountain. Time is a flying, and I'm sitting here going, I really need to start printing some more stuff for Rocky Mountain. I also need to start figuring out how to pack the Kia Soul with everything I want to take with me to Rocky Mountain because Mrs. Dragon is going to drive out there, and then me and Evil Diesel are going to fly in the day before on the 19th. And the plan is for us to fly in and then drive back after the show because we'll be driving a uh, moving van back. And once again, probably no need to keep that. Okay, now we're going to locate our two den rails, which are right here. Properly wrapped in, oh, found the end. I'm going to say properly wrapped in material that I'll probably never find an end for and just have to cut off, but. Yeah, I need to finish and ship them. Okay, so you're shipping them. See, my, Miss Dragon was like, hey, you can send a box or stuff if you want to get some of it sent out here already. And I'm like, but it all still has to go to the car to get transported up there. But I may be able to take a little bit of extra stuff, so I may actually send some stuff, you know, like the the tablecloth and just standard stuff for the table head. You can't wait for a retro maker hug. I can't wait for another Pez Liz hug. And and a K, and getting laid by K two Kevin again. So we're gonna slide the din rails into the DIN rail printed parts. We're gonna go ahead and put the panel do back here for now because uh, I don't think we're gonna be installing that anytime very soon. 
Um, you know, I'll be getting into that. Be that accessible. Um, so den rails into the den slots, and I'm not sure how far in they get. Well, actually, I can tell. So here's the the printed slot, and then if you look up here, you can see very faint ribs on this part. So you can see about how far in it can go. So simple thing of lining this up and inserting it in, pushing it all the way in. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Look at these ends. Rounded edge. They've obviously been deburred. Right? You can see where they've been filed down. Good on KB3D. A lot of times we have just straight cut ends and trying to get them started in a den rail. As I say that, then I see a bit of a burr from the file a job. But um, yeah, normally these are just straight cut and that's it. So you're left with a deep burr and trying to get it into the printed part. You're basically trying to cut into the part with the metal den rail. So I can deal with a little bit of fur that was left. But the simple fact that they took some time and tried is huge. Because normally I, you have to fight to get these on. That first one slid on like butter, and this one slides on like butter too. So, provided we didn't have any leftover burrs, we slide in very nice and easily. So, this is another sign of a quality kit where a manufacturer took some time to do some niceties. Now, like I said, there is a, a minor burr still left right on this inner edge. But that's easy enough to take care of. That and these are proper steel den rails. These are not aluminum den rails. And that's good too, because with the amount of weight that's going to be on these. This is going to provide some additional structural rigidity to the overall printer as well. There we go. These rails were slightly different size cut too, so. No worries there. So we got both den rails done. Now we're going to bring the machine up and actually install our rails. So I need to clear some space here. Um, where am I going to clear space to? That's the that's the big question. I'm going to need these. We pull these out. That goes in there, this closes. I'm gonna put the screws there so I can put boards on there. Just like that. This stuff we'll push over here for now because we'll need that during wiring. And this is the four, so while I'm at, I'm going to go ahead and swap this out, get this off here so I have 
room to work without knocking things around. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at um, Rocky Mountain. They're going to have both halls open, so it's going to be fun trying to get around and see everybody. I, I'm going to be a wreck after those two days, and then driving a truck back is going to be loads of fun just because I know I'm going to be so exhausted. So we need to orientate this in the right way, which means um, feet are towards me, right? Feet are towards me, our vertical rear bar. is to the left and we just have our um our tool mount and our z belt on the right okay so that's how we're set up yep and i will probably as soon as i get set up and figure out a table i will post on twitter and stuff where my table's at now I will, I'm going to try and be in the second hall because that's where KB3D is going to be. And I'm going to try and get set up over there by them like I did at uh, Murph and Irv. Um, yeah, just because that way, I, I don't know how many printers I'm going to take and if I can get enough printers, I may have another printer over at their booth. So, okay, so what we're gonna do is on the 20, or excuse me, the 4040 rails, not the 2060s, but our 4040 rails is where we're gonna mount uh, eight uh, T-nuts, or four at the top, four at the bottom, and these are, M4 T nuts. But yeah, I should be in the in the if I can get it set up the right way, I will be in the um in the I'll say the second hall. So if you were there last time, I will be in the new hall that they are opening up for this part of the sh for, for the show. And looking at this, it looks like we've got, um, they're facing separate, or they're facing outwards as our screw holes facing outward. So just be mindful of the orientation. This is under the printer. It probably just for aesthetics, but Got one without a ball. But yeah, definitely looking forward to seeing everybody again. Um, you know, it's been a while since Earth, aka 3D Printopia, and you know, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody again. It's been a rough been sort of a rough winter with everything that's been going on with work and stuff. So I need my social interaction time.
do this over on the side, and I'm sure that I will find the ball somewhere. On our den rails. Um well the last the last one I saw they were over in the in the new side. And that was I believe Wednesday night when I was on Justin's thing, but I'll double check. And one of the things I'm gonna do with Chris is I may be able to show up earlier in the day when they're able to start. So vendors get in before maker tables. So if I can get up there, I, I, I should have enough time to fly in and then me and Evil Diesel drive up to Loveland and be there in time that we can help him and Chris and whomever get his table set up. So we'll probably get in and start working that and that'll give me a chance to go and throw it, you know, throw stuff down on a maker table um, ahead of time. So we've got a print jig that we need to locate and uh, use this in the upper left extrusion. And I do have those print jigs. Oh. The. Okay, so we're using the den spacer right, so the den R. A little bit harder to see in the white, but Den R. And we're gonna put this right up against the foot, and then that's gonna set the spacing for our um, Den rail. So, So our, our, this is an underslung den rail or underslung uh, electronics, right? So rather than a boron where your electronics will be facing down, they'll be facing up. So your, your trough of your den rail is facing towards the top, if that makes sense. So make sure that you orientate that right. We're gonna need some M4 by 30. Pocket head cap screws. So we grab the right ones. We'll wind up needing eight. What I'm going to do is ream my holes because they are all kinds of tight. And then I'm not going to thread 30 millimeter screws through printed parts to put them into T nuts. Anyone who's flying into Denver that morning needs a lift, let you know you're flying in at 10 30. And as long as you don't mind to stop at Micro Center. Yeah, um, last year I did not get the Micro Center. That will be rec rectified this year. In fact, Mrs. Dragon's out in Colorado right now and has been to Micro Center twice already. And uh, I haven't gotten anything yet. So, well, excuse me. I've gotten receipts, but I haven't gotten anything from Micro Center yet. So I need to rectify that. I'm going to get this started very, very loosely just so I can get these lined up, top, bottom, all four. And then I'll uh,
then I'll worry about setting the right spacing. Okay, so I've got the top and bottom in to the T-nuts. So I'm going to put my spacer in and just move the top over. Now, before I lock those down, I'm going to go ahead and move that spacer down to the bottom. Get the spacing on the bottom to be the same. Lock the one side down on the bottom. Pull my spacer, move it up to the top again. Make sure it's nice and tight. Tighten down the one side. Now I can go back and tighten down the other side of both of them. And I should have this at a nice 90 degree angle. And that spacer to the side. Before I worry about the other spacer, I'm going to go ahead and get these screws set up, and I was going to say, you bet I didn't bring this one yet. But yeah, since I've got to go back down to the Aurora Denver area to um, get the stuff from the storage unit to drive back in the uh, moving van. It'll give me plenty of time to stop by Micro Center, and I'm sure Evil Diesel will just be upset to have to stop at Micro Center. <clears throat> but we'll stop at Micro Center. <laughs> and I'll have an entire moving van that I can fill up. So Micro Center may get dangerous. And no, it's not going to be that dangerous. Now, remember, you might need to adjust the printed parts, you know, move them up and down on the um, on the den rail to get things lined up, so you can get them in the in the T nuts. So do that if you need to. There we go. And we got that lined up. We're scooped that over. And the next thing it's going to tell us to do is. Use the center spacer. Again, this is DIN C. We'll place it in there. We'll move our DIN rail over. Move the top over. Pull our block, put it down at the bottom. Put the bottom nice and tight. Go ahead and snug up one side. Move our printed part back up to the top. Snug that up again. Snug down the one side. Now I can go through and snug down the 
opposite side, or far side. Yeah, my problem is my closest micro center is in Fairfax, Virginia, which winds up being like a six and a half, seven hour drive. So if we're going up to Bel Air or Earth, we can stop. Um, if we're going to Goshen, there's it's no bueno. And then when we go out to Rocky Mountain, we can go out there. Now, eventually, there's supposed to be one opening up in Charlotte, North Carolina soon, which that'll just be like a two hour drive. But we'll have to take the spouses with us because we'll have to, we'll drop them off at Ikea, continue on to Micro Center, come back and pick them up at Ikea with everything else that they've bought. So. All right, shenanigans, have a good one. Um, I don't think they have, I'm not sure if they have a micro center in Canada. So we've got the printed tools are set aside. Now we need our rigid IGUS chain and some M3 inserts. And we need a couple of printed parts in our M3 inserts. Probably the quickest I've found printed parts. So looks like it's this one and this one. We need two heat sets here and two heat sets there. All of them are M3s, so I am not going to move this. I'm just going to bring the heat sets up and do some heat sets real fast. I did switch that over to the M3. So Princess Auto is more of Harbor Freight. It's Princess Auto is comparable to our Harbor Freight, not Micro Center. Or at least that's what I understand from some other Canadians who have mentioned it. Now these will be hard to press on the bench, so I'm just gonna grab one of my um, tweezers and use the flat of that to make sure that we're getting it nice and flush. Oh yeah, Best Buy sucks for hobby electronics. Now, if you want like cameras and stuff like that, you're good, but hobby electronics, no. A micro Center, you can go and get all of your Arduino boards, your Raspberry Pis, your Maroni stuff, you can get all that stuff, you can get computer stuff, you can get 3D printer stuff, soldering stuff. Um, AV networking gear. I mean, you can get all kinds of stuff at Micro Center, but it's all tech related, not tools. Yeah, Radio Shack was good back in the day for hobby electronics, right? But
to him. Looking at these, I am going to go ahead and run a screw through all four of these just to make sure that we're good with some clean threads because I am seeing some material that's that got pushed down by the heat set. So I just want to make sure and pop all that out before we try and start putting in smaller flathead screws. Well, I think uh, I think Micro Center is going to be sticking around for a while. Best Buy and so like yeah, Fries and Circuit City was the other one. Yeah, um, Best Buy pretty much uh, beat out Circuit City, and we're now seeing the death of Best Buy in most places. But. Yeah, I, I was saddened when fries went away, but then again, I'd already moved out of California and I didn't have access to fries anymore. But you could still mail order from fries. Now, that's the one thing that I don't like with Micro Center is, you know, they, they post all of these deals, but they're in store. And so they, they need to provide some stuff that you can have shipped. Um, and I and I get it. It's it's a cost cutting thing, but you know that that's why Amazon still has a lot of business. I mean, if, if Micro Center would ship, there would be a lot of things people would be getting from Micro Center versus Amazon. Just bought a BQ Huracan for 140 bucks. Nice, Timor. Yeah, you can get something shipped, but not a whole heck of a lot. Not a whole heck of a lot. You know, it'd be great to be able to buy. You know, well, and like I said, a lot of the stuff that you see in their sales flyer, in store only, no shipping. And that just sucks. Okay, so we're now on this face of the printer. We're going to insert a 2020 M4 T nut on the 2020 outer edge side of the uh, 2060 bottom frame. And then, and that's an M4, and then we're going to put an M4 up here for the uh, for the 4040 slot. So I need we need one of those. The 4040 is down here once again on the 2020 side of our 2060 lower frame. And then our, our plot 8 or 4040 M4 nut goes on the, un, what is the underside, this side of our extrusion over here. in there.
Now we'll have the pit jig static chain lower. And this is interesting. I was looking at this shape and I'm like, that almost looks like the beginnings of a turning tool. I'm watching a lot of milling and turning stuff. So, hey tripod, welcome in. How's it going, John? Um, this is gonna go in this 2020 extrusion and be pushed all the way up against the edge of the 4040. Not sure I might have to move the bed ups. To get the carriage out of the way because this is supposed to wedge up right on right up against the 4040 and underneath the linear rail. And then this lower bracket. The one that has the cable type. It's going to go in with a M4 by 10 socket head. Please do this all Lurking, not allowed. He can learn. He's probably working on the uh probably working on his on his uh uh pavement princess. There we go. Trying to sleep and drive and the payment print. Um, please don't sleep and drive. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get this started in our 2040 slot there. I'm going to take my jig, put that in place and slide it up. Bring this up to said jig. And then we'll lock that in place. That's good. Move the printed pool set aside. Locate the 16 length, 16 length length of drag chain. I didn't think we were gonna get into drag chains, but apparently we are. <laughs> So we've got various lengths of chain. Eighteen. It's going to be way longer. That'll be the X axis. Seventeen. Uh, we'll we'll go with it mm -hmm. for now. We'll we'll remove one if we need to. I'll have flush surface mount and on these. So locate the sixteen length. We got that. It's actually seventeen. We'll take one out and attach the matching end length set to both sides. Note that if your energy change 
energy chains include these tabs, then we need to cut them off of each side so that they're flat. Okay, so we need to cut these tie down pieces. We'll just do that with a pair of snips. Okay. Pins are de snipped. <clears throat> and once again, this has 17, not 16. We may keep 17 on there for the time being. Once again, the Audi will go on the any side. Oops. And the other side, which is the any side, will go on the Audi side. So we're going to mount the which side? There are the static chain either end to the remaining 2040 mount with M3 by 6 flathead screws. M3 by 6 flatheads. So either end <laughs> goes the Audi end. So that'll be this side. We're going to install this to this piece. Looks like it goes on this outer edge here. Line that up and screw these in. Once again, it's looking like this. Since we're coming in from the back side, this is why it's really important to clear out the, the holes behind those. So. Getting some tortillas for lunch. Oh, cool. Hey, Nick, Nick. 
<clears throat> now secure the other end of the drag chain to the previously mounted part down here. And this goes on the, I've never gotten this, so. That. So you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm going to try and line this up. Find. Books. There we go. So this end is now locked down. The other end, we're going to bring up and we're going to loosely attach it with the 440 nut. Let me else. do the 440 nut with an M4 by 12 socket head screw. Looking at this, it looks like I do need to take that one link out. So it does need to be 16, not 17. So let me pop a link off. Okay, so 17 is too long and 16 is too short. Seriously? Don't let me hear spools. I'm going to figure out how to make this work. One's too small. This one seemed like it was too long. Oh, I guess not. Oh, I guess not.
Okay, and what we're looking for is for this to be straight and vertical. Or close thereabouts. Right, the shape should be fairly taut when all fasteners are tightened. And we want it to be visually parallel to the 2040. Now, we can get a little crazy here if we wanted to. And we're about 89 to the top of the chain. Be pretty close to uh, measured straight, and that's like you said, pretty taut, and that's going to provide some vertical wiring up and down. What's next? Power and data entry housing. So right down here, this spot, we're going to go on our 2060 in the middle groove of the 2060 on the bottom. And we're going to put in a couple of M4 2020 T-nuts. One facing up, one facing down. Need our housing. And just for grins, I'm going to go ahead and ream out our M4 holes. And we're going to use M4 by 8 socket head cap screws. Go ahead and mount this up, and we'll do the standard. We'll put in one and then adjust for the other. Now, the power hole goes towards the foot, the network hole goes towards the center. We'll get started down there with the lower one, get that started. And we will slide this up, get the other one lined up and started. Doesn't take much to use down. Ah, this is not really.
Once again, we'll get this one started and these get pushed all the way up to the 4040 extrusion. So we get both of these screws started. We push this all the way up and then we're going to tighten it down. Now it says to install the keystone jack and the AC outlet. Um, it's recommended to pre-wire the AC outlet before installing it. Definitely always good. And I'm not going to install either one of these just yet. I'm going to hold off. Okay, now it tells me to put the printer up on its feet. Easier said than done. Like I said, she's not fat, she's big bone, and she's chonky now. She's getting chonky. And as you can see, there's kind of a, a good layout here, so we'll raise our bed up some. We raised our bed up some, now it's time to start bringing in our components and one by one latching them on. So we're going to mount our power supply first and how are we set up here? Let me, let me double check. So I am reverse or I'm 180 degrees out of how they're showing it on the screen. So give me one second. Turn her around. There goes the bed rolling down on its own. Oh, there we go. Now we're now we're we're in alignment with the uh, view. So our big pulley on our Z is over on this side. This is our central upright. So now we're we're gonna lay some things in there. So our power supply is going to go in this back left corner. Power supply back left corner. Let me bring you guys down some so you can kind of see through the frame here. That doesn't work. Probably not going to work either. Um, See if we can't bring up the up. Oh, see there. So power supply. Next power supply is going to be our Raspberry Pi with our connections facing the center. Raspberry Pi light. 
Now we need our two um, pieces here, our buck converters. And I believe I'm going to put my 12 volt here and my 5 volt here because the 5 volt is going to be powering the Pi. So it just kind of makes more sense to do that. This is the 12 volt one. Twelve volt one, the five volt one, twelve volt, five volt, SSR. I'm going to turn my SSR around on the mount. Because I believe the load needs to be, since our bed wires are somewhere around here, I want my load towards the back of the printer. Turn this around on the mount right now. That changes once we get into the wiring wiring, then we'll change that around. There's our 12 volt buck, our 5 volt buck, our, um, whatchamacallit, our SSR. And then our duet boards are going to be over on this side with the larger board towards the Raspberry Pi and power supply side. Power outlets facing that way. And our other board, once again, with power outlets facing that same direction. So we got an ad break going on. While we're sitting here waiting for the ad break to finish, we're going to pop off our two tool heads that we've got built. And I built the Revo off stream last night. And then we built the E3D one on stream today. So there's our, whoops. Here's our two different tool heads. Right? Revo over here, V6 over here. V6 is rocking a um, whatchamacallit, a titanium heat break, nickel plated copper hot block, and a vanadium nozzle, the gamma nozzle from Sliceworks. And then the Revo is running a 0.6 obsidian. All of my tool heads on this printer are going to be 0.6. Hey, make your mind. So this one I built off stream. I've got two more of these to build. This one we built on stream. We just need to hot, hot tighten this once we uh, get everything going. And so we've got our electronics generic, or not generic, but the basic electronics layout done. Now we get to go through, and I believe we're going to do some 
um, table trough stuff. Here's from the underside. Z axis, zero drag chain. So we're going to need another drag chain part. This is the one we're looking for. And this is probably going to be the other side mount. So we need to add M3 by 4 heat set inserts on this one up here. And tell me, yeah, install, and then it tells me to go do the other heat set. All the heat sets at the same time. Chris, you're killing me. All heat sets at the same time. Part. Go in threes. So we're going to throw some M3 heat sets in here. Hmm. I have a feeling we're going to do some more here as well. And Bear with me one second. I am going to preemptively plug in my uh, external power for my mics because I know soon we're going to hit that stage where either the mic or receiver or both are going to die. So I get my mics receiver plugged into external power. Oops, not that one. Sorry if that gave you any feedback. There we go. All I'm doing right now off camera is putting in some heat sets.
couple of these. I gotta get the spore fat from behind the hole. How you doing, Dan? Were you streaming today? Before I do these heat sets, uh, or put the heat set away. I'm going to actually look forward and see because I have a feeling there's going to be a bunch more. Yep, there we go. These wire ducts, I've got four of those and two of those, and those get them on both sides. Now you need to be cognizant of which side is going where um, with your heat set. So on these two, they're being pushed in from the side with the countersink or the counterboard hole. And that's because the, the horizontal lower surface is actually going under a rail. Right? So you need to be cognizant of which way your your parts are actually being installed, make sure that you put your heat sets in from the right direction. And if needed, um, once you get them installed, you're going to need to run a screw through them to clean out the threads in the back side of the hole. So, just going to do some of these heat sets real fast. Bear with me, folks. I'm just trying to keep from having to put this away, then get it back out, put it away, get it back out. When the printer is getting to the point where I don't want to be manhandling it on and off just so you can see me do heat sets. I think you guys have seen heat sets enough through this build and others. Working on t-shirts. Now, are you printing your own or were you just designing them out? You weren't streaming yet, maybe later? Cool. 
How's SwitchWire doing? It's it's up and printing, right? Or never remember where you're at on SwitchWire because I know you weren't streaming all of it. So the other thing I'm doing is because the heat sets are going in through this side, you know, you're, you'd have to set it down like that. So I'm going to take this piece and either set it down so I can do it like this, or I've been doing them like this to give me a level surface to press down into. So just be aware, you know, look at the ways you can do things. And then on this part, which Cradles around, I believe this is cradling around the um, the 2010 right here. Um, we're coming in from both sides. So we got two of these to do. Okay. Well, the nice thing with the Nighthawk is it's it's USB, so it's not like a proprietary connector that you got to figure out how to rewire for the Libra. Could be plug and play. Hopefully, I don't see why it wouldn't be. Other than it's printing, and when you install everything on the Libra, you'll have to redo your your uh, in, your tie ins. Find out later tonight. I hear you there. Today we'll be catching up on Steve Build's stream. Then tomorrow's going to be watching Steve Build's stream. Among others, got a bunch. Just can't go public yet. Um,
Okay. Got great news for a Murph that you can't take public. He told me a few things yet. I'm not sure which ones, but. Major Gamer Geek Electronics are coming along, or yeah, coming along good. Um, which electronics are you working on? Hybrid Robotics. I think I'm good for now. I am going to go ahead and shut this off. I'll probably need to pop it back on a little bit later, but I've got enough stuff going here that we can progress fairly, fairly quickly through a couple of things. Roll back up, get this other drag chain going. Did that. We need to locate the 18 link, which would be the other one I think was 18. This is an 18 link. And once again, we need to cut the ends off of our, um, you know, the, the tie down ends off of our pieces. It tells us to do that. Remember to cut away the strain relief that's molded in. Yep, we're going to do that. Maybe. I do with the. Covered the snippers in parts. Makes it hard to know where to snip. Or... And put your ends on the appropriate side. Is being more difficult than before. There we go. Okay. Now we're going to take the Upper bedside Z chain mount. And go back to, we'll switch cameras again. Um, and looks like we hold it, hold it like this and we're putting this piece on this way. May have to cut or file this down. It's got a weird jog to it that makes it hard to cut flush without actually cutting down into it. That worked a little bit better. We go ahead and cut the those little end pieces off.
Definitely have eye protection on when you're doing that, folks. Since I'm not sure about cable routing, I will try and file those edges down. The, the other chain we did is, is a straight up down chain, so it's not as critical. We're not going to have wires moving or bending around those parts, but this we will. Get a little bit of filing to pretty that up. We want the Like it says, it doesn't matter which way you go. It sort of does, because depending on how you've done it. So this shows that my cable needs to be able to do this, flex in that direction. And my mounting is on this side. It don't flex in that direction, no matter which side I put it. So I need to switch both. I need to turn both ends 180. What I need to do. At least that's what it seems like. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Probably regret this decision, but we'll see. M3 by 6 flatheads. Four of those. One of them just tried to join his bigger brother. And we'll have to sort that out a little bit later. Okay. And this part. Line that up and get these screwed on. And screwed on, looking like it's bending in this direction. The other mount heat sets we did install 4040 M4 D nut to the upper slot of the lower extrusion, and then two M4 T nuts into the outer slot rear Z axis. Okay, so we need two 4040s. Or two twenty twenties and one forty forty. Here 
1920s go in here. In the 4040, we'll put that on the on the appropriate side of the bed here, because that will help. Okay, so looking at our thing, we're over on the power supply side, which is this side. So we'll have to put this camera aside and flip around momentarily. Printer. And I'm going to do it 180. Whoops. Because if I do it the other way, it won't fit right, and I have no idea what I just found. Cable chain that I'm going to. Okay, so we've flipped it around now. We've got our docking over here. We've got our power supply and our SSR and buck converters on this side facing me. So we're going to put the 2020. M4s on this side. And then the 4040 goes on the top of this bottom rail. So what are we going to do first? We're going to loosely attach the upper Z chain mount with drag chain to the previously inserted 2020 T nut using M4 by 8 screws. Okay, so we're mounting it looking like this on, on the bed. So what I'm going to do over on this side, line these up a little bit better. Says loosely because now we're going to have to put a spacer place piece in there. And this is our other long printed spacer. And it's going to go over the end and lock in the grooves. Then we'll bring this back, put it right up against it. That's where we're going to put our bed lock down, or the top mount. Put that aside. So we now have our side fasteners here, and I'll bring this around and show you guys once I, once I can pull you around. 
Loosely install the lower chain mount assembly by way of the following. Install and tighten the two M3 by six screws. Maker mine. You said that uh, uh, the Libre folks have been traveling a lot. Are they going to be making it to Rocky Mountain this year? Or are they going to make any of the shows this year? Or are they doing more shows like Born Next and stuff like that? We're going to need a M4 by 12. Twelve to mount that to the twenty twenty or to the forty forty extrusion. Sorry. And so, kind of like before, we're going to bring this around, line it up with the forty forty mount, and get it installed. And then we'll work on making sure that we're we've got a vertical. All right, sounds good. I just didn't know if I'd be able to chat with him face to face. And damn, that's good eyeballs on. That's pretty much damn near vertical. Once again, you want that to be a straight vertical. bring you guys around here and show you what I just did. So this mount is placed by using our spacer, right? Spacer comes in from the front and we use that to set the top z-axis mount and then the bottom goes down here into the 4040 keeping everything nice and parallel. What did we get put on next? Okay, our 2010 and wire ducts and all the wire ducts, we got all those. We got all these put together, well, put together. We got all of the heat sets done. Now we're going to start placing them around the lower deck um, in the appropriate spots. Before I get out and start doing the uh, those mounts, so I am going to grab a screw and clean up some of the swarf on some of these heat sets.
Oh, what kind of stuff do you need for Kimmy? Once again, I'm just running a screw through here to clear out the hole some and get some of the plastic that oozed behind the heat sets out of the way. Um, the last thing I want to do is have these installed and then have to uninstall them to try and clean these holes out because there's excess plastic back there. Can't get a screw in on them. Oh, gotcha. The basics for puppy. Okay, so now we need some 2020 M3 T-nuts. I have a feeling we're going to be getting into a few of these. So, that's going on this side of the rail so of course we get to spin our printer again <laughs> so they're going inside the 10 by 20 rail right here um, that's the support for the Z-axis um, motion system. I don't think there's a specific like position. And then we're going to take two of the ones that are U-shaped and they're going to go right up around there and we're going to attach them with M3 by 8 button head button head screw. Okay. Or M3 by 8 button head.
So black parts, black frame, and black uh, T nuts. Make for fun installation. Looking at these, the one almost looks like it's lined up with the DIN rail over here. We'll move that one over. This one, about maybe so, right? In, I guess they're both a little bit on the inside of the DIN rail. So we'll, we'll position the center points just a little bit inside of the den rails. And then we'll tighten them down. What we're doing is we're mounting these and then we're going to put our, um, our wire holders on these. Got those two on. Now we're going to locate the 230 millimeter length of cable duct. And I don't know. So, cable duct, we'll pop the top off of it. We're going to put four M3 by six button head screws in it. Three by six button heads with, so we're doing M3 by six button heads with fender washers. So that's the other point is we're gonna have fender washers that we need to put underneath here. So we'll get some of those out as well. Three by sixes and then M3. Fender washers. Yeah, P1S is, I think the P1S is a pretty good, like, dollar value. All things considered. I'm going to switch over to my ball in drivers for this one because they're shorter and two because they're going to be easier to light line and work with so looking at this we're going to be going into probably the second hole and third hole somewhere This is going to be a joy to try and get these done. One of those operations where putting it on its side would probably be easier. However, as I say that, it would also require the um, 
that would also require flipping this printer numerous times as we go to try and do these. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get these started, bring you around here and show you what I'm doing. And then I'll tighten these down once I get the, the spacing about right. Looks like it's pretty much in the back corner, which is sort of where we're at. By back corner, I mean up against this. Oh, that's sticking. You know, take this off and flip it around because it's it's uh, hitting the corner bracket, which is making it uh, not sit flush. We need this to sit flush. Right now, we're trying to play line up all the holes. So I had it this way going into the second hole. I'm going to flip it this way and go into that first section, that, that first full slide slot, and that should give me the spacing I need. If I need to move beyond that, it, I'm going to need to physically move the mount. Gonna work it out. I'm using this one because the square end makes it easier to hold these tiny M3 screws. But I'm trying to be careful because I don't know if you keep hearing, but I'm I'm catching this and scratching it up so. Not a deep gouge, but it's the knurling off of my driver. It's going to make my rail not as pretty, and I'm not going to like that. Okay, there's one. 
going to put the cable trough on it to keep it out of the way. Not lose it. One down. Where's our next one? Repeat the process for the other side. Means grab your other long extrusion, walk around your printer, do the same thing from the other side. Four screws with fender wire. at least be a little bit easier to We'll find the window washer a little bit later. All right, so we've got both of these on. Sneak them around there without knocking anything down. Ooh. So. Table trough on both sides of the 10 by 20 rail using these mounts. We put in the U-shaped mounts, so that'll allow us to provide uh, good wire routing. And then I think a lot of the rest are going down along the, the inside of the 26. Insert an additional. M3 T nut into the 22 extrusion right here in front of these two. Okay. That ought to be fun.
locate the threat wired shield Okay. Running out of options here on the front. Okay, that's this weird looking part. This just provides a shield um, for the rail or for the for the uh, ear. Get that. I'm going to have to lay this down on its side to have any chance whatsoever of getting this in. Because the only thing I can see is you have to come in from underneath. Now that we've got those wire ducts in place, it would have been easier to put it in before those wire ducts were in. Because of the relationship of the, uh, the gears. And I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to get this in this way. Maybe. Get it in closer. There we go. Hmm. Hurt. Still not lined up. Let me show you guys what I'm dealing with. So, this shroud here has to go over the 2020, and the, the top flat part goes over the wheel, right? The top flat part's over the wheel. So, the only really way you can do it is to kind of come in at a weird, wonky angle like this. It would have been better to. Do the one either do this first, then put these on, or do this side on the duet boards, then put this piece on, then do the other field. I think that would have been the better order of operations to make it even plausible. Um, M3 by 8 button head through. Yeah, so far, I mean, there's been a couple of things, but the majority of my... I'll say, I'll say the biggest gripes I've had with the manual is just order of operations. And once again, they're they're looking at build a subassembly, install a subassembly, not build all the subassemblies in a section and then add them to the printer, which is what would be needed if you're trying to do this on a small workbench. Okay, so apparently.
excuse me. Um, trying to position the nut. Oh, uh, just comparative speaking to like the P1S versus the X1 versus the P1P. Uh, is Actually, is it the P1S or the P1P that everybody is saying is, is the best all around because you can easily um, enclose it. And you can run the whichever one you can enclose and run the AMS on. Because I know one you can't run the AMS on. And the other one you can't. Yeah, I went the mouse. I need light. Yeah, that's that's really what I'm I'm meaning is the one that you can get and then upgrade to the AMS um and put panels on that's the better of the options. And it's not as expensive as the full we'll say the full Monty X1 carbon and you still have some upgradeability to it. All right, me and this particular M3 nut are not seeing eye to eye. So I think I have it positioned right and centered. And then I put the screw in and it goes cattywampus on. We're about to have a very not nice conversation. Once again, order of operation. This would have been so much easier to put in place before um, putting those side pieces. Cool. Or before putting the, uh, the cable cross on. Reach for the mouse that is... Not there.
Now, what's the next operation? How do I need to move this? Hey, Mini Bice, how's it going? I thought one of them you, you couldn't. Well, what I'll say one of them is more what the P, between the P1P and the P1S, one of them is more stunted than the other. So you want the middle one is basically where I'm getting it. All right, so we're going to go along the back 20, uh, the 2020 part of the 2060 here. So I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees and we're just going to play with. Uh, Try and use gravity to our advantage. Easier said than done, but we're going to try. Feet hanging off the front. So, no? Okay, there. Feet there. I'm going to be working right here on this, on the 2020 edge of the 2060. There. So maybe I'll bring the other camera around and we'll flip over so you can see what I'm doing. There we go. Once again, our electronics are here. I don't know why this is reversed. And we're going to be mounting stuff here and then over here on the other side. So on the side closer to me that's got the power supply, we're going to put two. We're going to put one over here. And these are our M3 2020 T-nuts. So once again, two on my side. And then one over here. Fair enough, Garrett. Thanks for the prime sup. I appreciate it. And for six months in a row. That's pretty awesome. So we're going to put three more of our, well, three of our ones here with M3 by 8 button head screws. Good. These with this one. So these would go towards the bottom. I'm not going to lock these down just yet because I may want to slide them around a little bit more after the first fiasco. Because they're not giving me like, hey, put them here or put them there.
those are still a little bit movable, um, which is what I'm going to want. And we're going to locate the 200 millimeter length and a 100 millimeter length. Two hundred millimeter length, of course, goes on the side with the two. The one hundred will go on the other side. These are going to attach the same way with the M three by six screws. You want them spaced so that they uh, they kind of don't overlap. So we need to move these way over. Because it'll make getting the the lids off. If, if, if this is embedded underneath the other one, it's going to be hard to get the lid off. So you do want it so that you can get access to the lids easily. And if you can bear with me, I'll show you what I mean. So I'm trying to get these space so I get to all four of the screw holes, but I can move it down so I'll still be able to take the tops off of either one when I do them or when I need to open them up. I'm going to need to do the same thing down here on this one. That's what I'm working on right now. See you guys up here, hopefully with too much. Uh, Too much shakiness and that. And like I said, out of all the printer builds to date, this one you're definitely going to get a workout on. Um, Okay, now this next one is going to be a small one. And so we're once again going to have to make sure that we can get to our screw holes. Still have good coverage around where we need to.
that orientation will be better. Some of this, there really isn't an easy angle because while I have gravity with me as I'm trying to get the screws in, I also have gravity against me because I've got a flange washer trying to get in there as well without dropping it off the screen. Dang it, and I just realized I don't have didn't lock that bar in. Thanks for the lurk, Pez Liz. Okay. Uh, that one snaps there with no problems. Good. And we should have one more left. Where is this one? This is at the front edge up here. Um, so I'm going to have to pop you guys off of here and move the printer in. Let me see how I want to move it. Think about it. Stand it up. Mm -hmm. So our last um, 
The last one is going to go right here in this area. So we're going to need one of our M3 2020 T nuts. That in here. We'll need our last mount. M3 by 8 button head screw. This is definitely not going to be its final resting place. Somewhere right. Maybe. Maybe close. And. Last one of our 100 millimeter. Remove the cover, secure the main body to the forward facing surface. Requires two M3s and fender washers. And it shows it being kind of moved all the way over here in the corner. We're going to have to see. We're going to have to move over some. Go there. Show it being fairly tucked into that corner. Get it there that way. All right, so we need two more M3 by six and some fender washers, and we're almost done. We are about home free. One side started, now we need to get the other side, and then we'll be able to tighten them up. Ooh. 
was fine. Let's uh, put a couple of things up and out of the way, see where we're at and what we've got left to go. We've got all of our things. We're going to confirm based on looking at the image where we're at. So bring you guys up here with me. So we've got our power supply, we've got the uh, power inlet outlet leads here with a piece of wire trough that goes right up to our big, um, our big drive gear for the Z-axis. We've got the shroud around our Z-axis. We've got the two long cable troughs down the side or down the middle. And then back here, we've got a short length in front of our duet board and a longer length in front of our SSR and other power uh, butt converters. So I think at this point, we're good as far as setting up for wiring. We've got one more drag chain to work on. We need to add a couple of heat set inserts. Trying to see if I need to add anything for the other mount. No, because so I just need to do the two more heat set inserts on the last part. And we're going to be working up here for this next piece, so I'll raise you all up some. Okay, so we need to do some tidy up here. So we're going to put these away. Um, we're going to need heat set. And bring this up. We've got our M3 heat set installed there. Get that turned on. Grab our last part. This is a lot bigger. It's got a bigger hole in it. Um, it looks like it has wire ties top and bottom. We're going to be putting heat sets into these two holes here. These are M3 insert or heat set inserts, so just need two. We're pressed in, burnish, pop off any plastic that's stuck through the back.
furnished front edge and quickly pull out the plastic from the back if possible. Yeah. Unplug that and set this down. I'll just screw through here real fast to clean that one out. All right, and we're getting near to the end here, folks. Uh, not too many pages left in this section, and I am personally dwindling, so we may wind up completing this on the next stream, which would make the next stream we focus on um our tool heads because I'll build the rest of the tool heads offline and we'll focus on doing the um, tool head um, or what do we call it like uh, checking the clearances and stuff for the tool heads and then we'll come back and at some point we're gonna have to start doing some wiring and I was asking Chris if there's a dedicated wiring diagram because I haven't seen a wiring diagram yet for black box. So we'll have to look into that and see what we can find there. So next up, we got our heat sets in. We're going to put some 4040 T-nuts in. And of course, they go over here. Turn her around. Forty forty M fours. It goes in this back left. Say back left. This is actually the front left corner, right? Yeah, front left corner. And the holes go towards the corner. Or um, M4 through holes go towards the corner. We're going to install and secure this down with some M4 by 12 socket head screws. One started, then we'll get one face. It started. And it looks like the it basically goes right up against the the joint where the printed part, the printed corner piece and the uh forty forty extrusion go right at the edge there. Tighten these down.
Final install position should have contact with the edge of the upper corner bracket. It does. Locate the 34 length Higus 10, 16, 18. This is a thicker chain than the other two that we did. So this is a, a lot thicker. And it says 34 lengths. So I'm not sure how many we have here, but we'll count them. Got 34 links here, and we're going to put ends on them. And once again, these ends have even bigger cable ties, so we're going to have to cut these off. Which means once again, folks, uh, protect your eyes. You only get one set. Where that went flying too, but the uh, be on the search for that later on. Once again, we're going to be having wires and water lines and PTFE tubes and everything running around these areas. So we want to make sure that they're nice and uh, dressed as far as the edges go. So we will be taking a file of this to make sure that these edges are not burtastic. Okay, so the two ends, the ends go on the appropriate edges.
anybody has a trick for getting these on first time every time, I would love to hear it. So, say to put both on or just the one? Does it touch both of them? So, I'm going to hold off and attach the other one in just a second. So we're going to start by attaching this end on this side. Here in the chain with the female end. The female. Look at this end. This is the end that I'll say has the Audi. So the length for this end piece is on the outer edge. Right? That's how I always try and figure those out. So we're going to need some. Uh, M3 by 6 flathead screws. I don't know about the other side just yet, so I won't, I won't grab those. We'll get this mounted on this side. So we're mounted on this side. Secure the other end to the of the X chain to the upper left face of the X plate using two blow-offs. So this is why I wanted to kind of look at how this was going to mount so I knew which way to Pop this one in. There we go. So this is going to come right around and mount like this. Okay, and we're going to do it with two M3 by 6 flathead screws again. So we'll grab two more of those M3 by 6s. Walk around on this side. So I can see a little bit easier when I do this. So there's our cable chain, our last cable chain. <clears throat> now what's left? Locate the five print line holder parts. So there's, these are two part pieces. Secure the part one. Part one is this part that has the flat edge, not the rounded over part. We're going to secure part one to the inside base of the fourth chain link, not including the end link. And these are going to be done with tie wraps. So. Got to dig out the tie wraps. In this box. No.
Oops, I'm looking for the tie wraps that came with the kit. Yeah, I'm pretty sure tie wraps came with the kit, but uh, not seeing them off the top of my head here. There. Tie wraps there. I'm not going to get hung up on tie wraps. If, if I can't find them here in just a second, then I will grab my own. No tie wraps somehow jumped into the panel door, so oh well. We'll use our own tie wraps. It just seems weird that we've had everything else up until now. And normally when I can't locate something, I find it like, you know, the next time I look, because I just overlooked it. Um, but no worries. Tie wraps are easy. These look like skinny tie wraps, so I've got some skinny tie wraps. Okay, so we're going to go into the fourth link, not the end link. So one, two, three, four. So we're going to attach it to this link and it literally attaches all the way around. The linkage. Now it shows um, like indents on the on the uh, it shows indents in the cable chain in this uh, diagram. I'm not seeing the indents. I also just put that on the wrong side, so. Because it goes starting from the inside. So I put this on the outside. It needs to go on the inside. Okay, first cable tie put on, first cable tie cut off. Glad we got that out of the way. Through. One, two, three, four. We're going to go on to this one here. Before I tighten it too much, I believe there is a recommendation on where uh, it's best to orient the tie wrap so that the lock meets the outside upper corner of the chain. See the following two images to visualize. So looking at this, you're, you're routing it down through the cable tie and out. Actually wants me to pull this around like so once again cable chain goes under through the part over the top comes out this way and we're going to work on getting that nice and tight 
We want to still be able to open our cable chain because that will make our routing a heck of a lot easier. Okay. So, so we don't want to put it right over that, but we'll put it right next to it so that we can still open said cable chain and not impede anything else. That fairly tight. Hand off. And we're going to do this, I think, four more times. Yeah, keep part two aside until after we run the water cooling lines and or the remote lock cable. Not using the remote lock cable. But it shows you how to do those zip ties as well. Come back to that in the water cooling section. And now we need to do this step four more time at specific link count. So we will go through and do this again. Give me one second here to clean up a couple of squigglies on some parts. What I do is just get this started. Two, three, four. Pretty close to being at the right one. Work on bringing this up and cinching it. So once again, we can open up that um, cable chain right there. That one's on. Next one in line is 16. These might wind up having to go right over the um, the openings of the links. That's okay because that will we should be able to still pass them through there, no problem. It gets it off the the actual motion system so it doesn't snag in the Sixteen is twenty two, so we'll go another six. And then 27s, five more.
Okay, so we got zip ties in for the zip tied pieces here in. The offset probe, locate the sex bolt housing. Orientate, orientate is shown and install four M2 heat set inserts. Okay. Be our sex bolt housing. We need to put in four M2 heat sets here. We move stuff out of the way and we can get that done. We're getting close, folks. We're getting close. You know what, though? It is 5 p.m. And I think it's time to call it. Because if not, I am going to crash and I am going to crash hard. So I am going to go ahead and do these heat set inserts. And meanwhile, I want everybody to start looking at where you might want to raid out to today. Y'all could do that for me, I'd be appreciative. Where do you all want to raid out to today? Hey, okay, what these little M2s don't take much at all. You barely blink at them and they start an insert. Not a whole ton of mass there. All right, I hate to ask, is, is there like nobody else here or are you just not uh, responding, hoping I just continue to keep going? Because I know you guys are sneaky like that. Sex bolt uh, heat sets are in. You just got back? Okay, shenanigans. Need to let that cool. And meanwhile, I need to find the bushing.
and I have seen those, but they are not in that stuff. Which box? Not in that one. Users. Sex ball. Here's the bushy. So we've got a couple of bushings that we're going to press in here. You're here, you're just building. Oh, I, I understand you. That's what I'm working on right now too. We're going to take these little bushings. We're going to press fit them down from the top. Doubt very seriously if I will be able to press them by hand. So I'm going to use my Nipix once again, because Nipix are awesome. One. Next one. Got them lined up on top of each other. So shenanigans, we are working almost, we're almost done with the electronic sick. Um, I'm just starting to wear out what's happening. So we inserted our two uh, bearing, pushing bearings, sleeve bearings into the housing. We're going to install the sex bolt PCB with some M2 by six button head screws. It only goes in there one way. Um, yeah, we've got the All of our electronic boards have been mounted in the printer. So do yourself a favor, test fit your board. If anything's hanging up, now is a darn good time to scrape an edge or um, fix a bit of Printed garbage that's in the way, like a bad overhang or something. Just do yourself a favor now, rather than trying to jam your sex bolt in and then having issues later. And yes, I am trying to have that conversation with a straight face and not making any jokes about. You know, your sex bolt.
be an issue with the print geometry. Okay, so I'm going to do this on stream for Chris. So there's a gap here between the board and the print, right? That gap, I'm assuming, is associated with the fact that might be hard to see, but this edge of the print is a rounded shelf to ease printability rather than a hard than a hard overhang. And it's going to prevent the end stop from pressing all the way down in there. And I don't know if I can get the angle in here from the camera in lighting you guys to see that it's a rounded okay, let me see if I can so you see that this the cavity part where my thumb's at it's there you go it's a rounded over shape which is great for printability, but it fouls out on the end stop too quickly. So you can't get this board completely down and flush against the printed part. So just be aware of that when you're putting in, because I don't see anything in the manual and it shows as if it goes really flush. I just have a feeling if I try and cram it down flush, I'm going to damage a part. Okay, I need two by six button head. Four of them.
Okay, now I will say that this board did screw down flush. It just wasn't sitting flush from the get-go and I'm not sure why. Ah, so the screws will go flush, but I don't know if you can see that. That actually bowed the board and you can see light underneath the board. I'm gonna loosen those screws some. I don't like that. I don't, I don't like bending circuit boards like that. Never a good idea. Yeah, that, that is a print, we'll say, design issue that needs to probably be looked at. Chris, if you're looking at the uh, BOD later on. Stretch bolts there. Insert two 20 series M4 nuts into the rear lower extrusion slot of M2040, or excuse me, 2040 bed frame, the side of the leftmost 2020 rail is. Okay, this is, might be a little bit hard. So what we're looking at here is, in this diagram, on the left side, we're seeing the post. That is our tool side, right? We are going down here in the, so this is the, um, On our bed frame, this is the leftmost 2020. We're going to be putting our 4040s in the lower section of the 2040 in this in this area right here. So we need these were M4s. So these were a couple of our 2020 M4 Roland T nuts. And the uh, screw holes are on the outer outer edges. Put these two in there. Okay. And then we're going to mount sex bolt. Install sex bolt subassembly, securing it with M4 by 14 socket head cap screws. The install location of the assembly should be such that the printed part is flush with the 2020. So we're going to move it all the way over here once we get it installed with a couple of M4 by 14 screws, bolts, whatever we want to call them. Clear out our holes. And I'm just going to try and line. Line this up and probably stop dropping the bed down because I'm pretty sure I have it all kinds of cattywampus. Okay, now I'm going to push it all the way over in the front corner. Tighten it down. There we go. The so sex bolts in. I won't put in the uh, pin until I need to because moving the printer around, that pin will fall out because it's not captive. OK. 
Now note the shaft is not secured and may fall out if the machine is overturned at any time. Those shafts are in the electronics box, I believe. I think they were, I think they were. I think I'm stoned because they were not. Means they must be in the other box over here with the rest of the linear shafts that we've been using forever. That's M5 by 43. I do not have M5 by 43. I have M5 by 45. Got a couple of those. No, M5 by 43. Yeah, and light tap does trigger the end stop. I'm over here playing Morse code. Now the question is whether this is the right height or if we need to find an M5 by 43 because there's not one in the kit that I've seen. We will, like I said, we'll do that later. I'm not going to leave that in there because it'll come flying out. I'm sure it will. So what's next? Um, bed wiring Wago mount. Okay. We've got Wagos, we got Wago mount. And then I'm seeing one other type of printed part that will probably need to be installed. And then that should be the end of this section of the manual. Cleared out those. We're going to install our Wagom. Um, all of these are the two pen Wagos. The one side will come in from the bed, the other side will come in from the uh, wiring deck. So you take your Wago, the lift up lever is towards the front edge. I just kind of get it started, then push it back. That actually fit pretty good. Now, normally when you start to get more of these side by side, they get a little bit harder, but if your print tolerances are good, they all go in pretty darn easily. What's happening is it's going under this rear ledge and then clipping down into the gap right in that front ledge there. So it, it goes in and it doesn't come out too easily. I've, I've broken them getting them back out of these clips before. There's our five Wagos set up. And where are we going to mount this on the bed? Insert two M4 T nuts into the same extrusion slot as step nine, this time on the right side. So I'm assuming we're going over here on this side because we're at the lower end of the 4040. There's sex bolt right there, I believe. So yeah, we're going over here. Um, four and fours. Probably going to do some M4 by 14s or something.
place. M4 by 10 socket head screws. M4 by 10. The good news is we're starting to run out of fasteners. Dang it. The position of the mount should be roughly centered with the heated bed assembly, but is largely non-critical. So, kind of eyeball center it based on looking at this mount and going straight across. Okay, an M4 by 10, this just bottomed out, either that or the, or the, yeah, it rotated in there on me. Like I said, we're just kind of eyeballing it. There we go. Almost there. Locate the print LED mount and install an M3 heat set insert into the shown location of all six. So let me swap out my heat set insert nub here. Back to M3s. Parts, M3 heat set inserts. The nice thing is, is these are, an, these are at an angle, which will make it fun. So 
I'm definitely going to use the side of the bench to get these set up. Kind of sort. Kind of sort. Because what I'm doing is because of the angle on this, I can't really use the self press as I normally would. So I'm kind of doing it by hand here. Get it warm, start it in, don't drive it all the way. Do it the rest of the way on the bench. That way I can make sure that it's going to be nice and flush and burnish off any of the uh, filament that sticks out around the, around the heat set. Those six are done. I believe that's all we're going to have there. The rest is we're going to locate our daylight on a stick. Be sure at each end to the previously prepared printed parts. Of Okay, so we're done with this, so I'm going to pop this off, set it down here. We're going to need our M3 by 6 button head screws. And our three daylight on a stick. Now, there is an in and an out on these. Got to look at it and figure out which is which. I'm assuming the R1 to R10, that R1 would be the in and R10 would be the final one in that run. At least that, that kind of sounds right to me. So we're going to set that up with the R1 will be on the right hand side, R10 will be on the left. And we'll set that for each one. Because there really is no directionless.
first soldered these pens on did not get them really straight when they I'm going to set them up with the R1 on to the right, as that will be the input. Um, we're not doing any wiring today, so if this is wrong, we'll figure it out. Two and the last one. They're going to probably want me to install them on the printer. Here's those three done. Yeah, like I said, I just wish there was there was no there's no indicator on these. Um Yeah, there's just no indicator. I mean, R1 is listed here. And I'm going to assume this is the input with R10 down here. Um, but if you look at that, it looks like it's been put upside down because if I just take this straight, flip it over. You, everything can be read. So normally you would read left to right. You'd think left to right, this would be in, that would be out. But with R1 down here and R10 over here, I'm assuming we out. R1. So these are basically getting mounted upside down from the. Normally you'll have a directional arrow, but there's no directional arrow on the front or the back. Forty series in four. Use six total T nuts to populate all sides except for the tool dock side. And fours. And once again, we're doing all sides but the tool dock side.
Then we will install these. M4 by 12 socket head cap screws. Um, Okay, now let's try this again. So we're going to go in in such a way that it points the lights down. Roughly centered within the length of extrusion, okay? Walk around the printer and make my life easy. Just realized I still haven't updated the camera, so sorry about that. Give me one second and I'll. Hello again. So I'm just going around and installing the light. And as noted, we're going to try and get these roughly centered on the three sides going around. Got two in. The last one. This will be a little bit more fun because we've got to get around our um, wiring stuff here.
Storm in is here. This is out in, out in, out. So we should be coming in here with our input, most likely being able to jump right into the, the chain here and then going around. We're following the rest of the wiring from the tool head chain. And with that, I thought we were done. I thought we were done. M2 by 8 socket head cap screw. Almost. One last thing. M2 by 8 socket. Hmm. I guess the 2 by 8s are socket head. So this goes on this side of the tool head. So we do have one ZN stop. There is no wiring done on this just yet. So we are, we'll have to probably pull this off to do some wiring on it. But for now, It wants to be installed right here, so that's where we're going to install it. Okay, so that got installed underneath there. So, kind of give you a fly through. We've got our cable chain at the top. We've got the preparations for our water lines to be added. We've got a pool head done. We did both a E3D V6 style on stream today and I had already previously done a Revo style. Both of these are running B or uh, six millimeter hot ends. So those are prepped and ready. I've got two more tool heads to build. I'm gonna do those off stream. Uh, we've got our Perimeter daylights on a stick going. We've got our sex bolt built and installed. Our five Wago mount for our bed. Underneath, we've got our power supply, Raspberry Pi, uh, Duet 6HC, Duet 3HC, and our SRR, our five volt and 12 volt buck converters. 
Now we got all of our cable management pieces in place. We've got our uh, bed cable chain in place, and we've got our Z axis cable chain in place. So everything I think for this section is done as far as electrical part installation. We did not do, and we have not done any wiring at this point. Um, that is going to be in another stage. And I reached out to Chris because uh, it doesn't talk like this electronic section talks about in like physically mounting the electronics, not wiring the electronics. So we need to figure out like what's the plan for wiring? Is there just a wiring diagram? And away you go. You're an ex you're an ex uh, an experienced and advanced builder, so you know what you're up to and what you're doing, or what have you. So I will be getting with Chris and Poity about that. Uh, hey, Bear Gorillas, welcome back in. It's the Black Box Tool Changer. Yes, it is. And we just installed this Z end stop. Once again, there's no um, there's no wiring to it. It's just physically installed. We have no wiring set to anything. Uh, we should. I thought we were done. I thought we were done. Is it? Okay. Install the fan. Locate the 3010 blower fan. Located two M2 by six button head screws. Okay, we can do that. It is recommended to chamfer or otherwise open up the mounting holes on the 310 fan to allow the button head screws to sit closer to flush with the face of the fan. Why wouldn't they? Which way is this getting mounted? Oh. Gotcha. So normally, you would mount it through this flange down into some. Through this flange down into some. In this case, we're mounting from here up into the um, printed part ahead. So this is going to be sucking air off of through the cavity. So this is pulling air off of our um, oh, I was going to say tool head, but it's not tool off the extruder and around the extruder motor and then blowing it out. This is going to be part of your part cooling fan, but it does have actually this is your part cooling Interesting. Okay, um, so we need to get this installed. It says to countersink, camper or otherwise open up the mounting hole. That a little got a burring slash countersink, countersink piece, but only so far you can go before you run out of real maybe. So I'm just opening up this hole and doing a little countersink on it. Same thing on the other corner.
They were talking about using M3 by six button heads, but uh, three by six or three by eight? Oh, M2 by six. M2 by six. Uh, Two by button head. Why this half of your bed and go? And I know I have some other M2 hardware over there. If it is countersunk screws, I will swap these button heads out with countersink. If that's what that other, what my other is over there. One found its hole very quickly and easily. Found it. Nice and snug. So we finally have another wire added on. And with that, Hey, little John original, how's it going? You're almost there. You're almost there, but we're done with this part. We are done with this part. Um, this section is done with. This was the electronic section. Um, I want to talk with Chris because the next section per the Black Box website. And the guides is the electronics. Let's go over here. Okay. So we have the electronics mounting, which is a section that we just walked through. And then next is the counterweight. So you do the counterweight, and then it's enclosure and water tool. Like, I would assume that we would do wiring, preferably before counterweight, but definitely before enclosure. So I, I need to get with Chris and find out one. Uh, I, I've got, I'm waiting for my wiring kit to come in. And then two is, do we still have a wiring di diagram or is everything going to really be plug and play? Ready to go. Oh, yes, it definitely deserves more than Haribo per section. What this deserves is I'm going out and grabbing some food. Because the digital dragon is hungry. I cannot explain to you. I am hungry. I am tired. I've got a Pressure pain point right here in my back. 
And yeah, like we can probably do the, whoops, it'd be on this side, the counterweighting system without too many problems, but it's just you add the counterweight and then if you have to flip the printer around, it's added weight, right? And so I don't wanna be adding any weight to this than I need to prior to doing the wiring. Because if I'm gonna to have to be flipping this on its side to make it easier, I, I wanna do that now before I add any more weight than I already have, right? So we're getting there, a couple more things. We're getting close. Um, just a couple more sections left. Counterweight, I don't expect that to be very long at all. Oh, thanks, Bear. Yeah, I... I don't necessarily mind putting in the extra time. Um, well, let me rephrase that. It's Saturday, my wife's out of town. If it was six o'clock and I had been streaming for eight hours and my wife's downstairs waiting on me, um, you would not see me Tuesday, possibly not Thursday, maybe not ever again. So uh, be thankful that Miss Dragon isn't here. But uh, yeah, we make great progress. This sucker is definitely going to be heavy after today. Like I said, we've got all the electronics, the den rails and everything installed. So uh, it, it gained some mass today. So with that, uh, I thought we were going to be rating out sooner. Uh, let's see. Let's see if some of the people that would have been on are actually still on so we can rate out. Um, let's see. We've got... Uh, Chaos Drucker, AZ Pinoy, Ben Shop doing some live robot, robot combat from Tucson, Arizona. Pick Stitch, Married with Spawn, Ugly Move, Sid Heresy, The Jerry Show, Him for the Day, doing a charity stream. And by the way, for those of you that were here Thursday night, we rated out to, was it the, that artist Amelia? Apparently her, her afternoon gaming streams, like, I, we'll, we'll call that um, 18 plus. Uh, as I was listening more to that, as I was cleaning up, I, I apologize, I would have said 18 plus had I realized I had not, that was the first time I'd been on while she was gaming. Normally during the day, like weekdays, like during the daytime, um, she's painting. And when she's painting, it's, it's a different vibe on the stream. I'll put it that way. Um, so I just heard one for Vile Mods. I think I am following Vile. Hi. Giving me the option. Let's do a look for the, yeah, bio underscore mods. So it looks like he's doing some design work. I was about to say CAD, but I'm not sure what program he's using there. It looks like he's doing some type of modeling. So thanks everybody for being here. Um it was very much a, a marathon day. Welcome on in, uh, Matt. And uh, thanks, for, uh, Timor, for suggesting Vile Mods. We will go over there. Uh, thanks, Shadell. Um, I'm out for the day. So um, I will see you all again Tuesday evening. Once again, we are switching our weekday stream times to starting at 6 p.m., partly because I may wind up having to go into the office on Thursdays, and partly because it just gives me a little more time to adjust with some of the things that have been going on at work lately um, before jumping on stream. So uh, thanks everybody for being here and hanging out for an extremely long stream today. And I will see you all on Tuesday. Let me get this raid started over to Biomods. And uh, once that's ready to go, 
uh, we'll jump out here and I will see you guys on Tuesday evening. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Dinner and a drink. Yes. All right. Bye now.